And we're off and running on a Saturday, uh, a couple hours normally behind schedule, but uh, 12.09 on the West Coast, 3.09 on the East Coast. Welcome to the Pig and a Pickle Crook Show, brought to you by Pig and a Pickle. Normally, we come at you Saturday morning at 9 a.m. The coach had something going on, uh, so we'll catch up with him next week. But Dieter Kurtenbach is in the house and one of my favorite guys to talk sports with, Dieter a host at uh, KMBR 680 in San Francisco, a writer at for the San Jose Mercury News, and he has his latest seven-round mock draft out there as it pertains to the 49ers. And I'm a big mouth know-it-all, but man, I'm when I'm when I'm doing these things, I'm looking for like-minded big mouth know-it-alls. That's right. And Dieter is just like me. <laughs> He's also a big mouth know-it-all. No, but no, I, I, I love, uh, I love, I love you, Dieter, because you know you go granular on everything. You'll, you'll go granular yeah. on the Warriors. You'll go granular on the Giants, and then of course you can't do this t- this time of the of the year, um, mo- you know, with Forty Nine er content. If you don't go granular, because yeah. We're in the draft season. The draft is coming up the 25th, 26th, 27th, which means it's a couple weeks away. And um, if you don't go deep on this stuff, it's like, well, you know, I, I will catch up with you after the draft. Uh, you know, I mean, um, <laughs> it's as simple as that. And you do go deep on this stuff, and I appreciate you um, for that. And I appreciate yeah. you joining me, man. So how are you? How's things I'm, going? I'm, I'm wearing that great. Giants hat, even though they're not scoring any runs. Well, maybe maybe they uh, reverse it today against the Tampa Bay Rays. We'll find out. I mean, uh, just keep not hitting with runners in scoring position. I'm sure it will work out great for you guys. Um, <laughs> you mentioned going granular. Like, I love draft season because it is also an opportunity to evaluate analysts. Um, and you can find out pretty quickly who knows what the hell they're talking about when it comes to football and who doesn't. And obviously there's always going to be the level of ignorance that comes from just not being in, you know, the coaches meeting rooms, all that, you, you, you know, enough to know, you don't know a lot, but when you think about the draft, it's so much about scheme players that they have identified in the past that they like to fit what it is. They do coaching, uh, ideologies. All of that stuff, it's very tough to do it on a broad NFL scale to have that kind of almost nuclear understanding of everything that everyone is doing all the time. There are some guys who do it. They do it at a very high level. But um, the opportunity to do it for just the 49ers, really hone in on what it is I know, what it is I hear, what it is I think about uh, the team itself and sort of express that knowledge or whatever the hell it is onto draft prospects is a really fun process for me. Well, and and uh, you have an article up at the San Jose Mercury News on what you would do in each round for seven rounds, and we'll get into that. We're also going to do um, a live mock on this show. Some people think that's bad content, but with me and you, I think it'll be good because I know it could you be know awful, Larry. But I'm going to have a blast. It, yeah, it could be awful, but um, who's going to fire us? And then <laughs> at the end of the day. Um, who's going to fire us No, but we got lots of good people in the chat. We're brought to you by pig and a pickle, the best barbecue in Northern California. Check them out in Emeryville, Corte Madera. They're open seven days a week from 11 a.m. till 8 p.m. or until they run out. We're also brought to you by Marin auto glass. Uh, if you live in San Francisco, odds are you either have had your windshield shattered or you will be having your windshield shattered and you need to know who to call. And that's our good friends at Marin Auto Glass. You can check them out online, marinautoglass.com. Great company. They'll come out, sweep away the glass. You give them the VIN number. They'll bring the correct windshield. They'll hook up all your systems to it and everything. It's not just a, you know, they're very, very, very good. So check out Marin Auto Glass. We're also brought to you by Underdog Fantasy. Check the link in the description. Use the promo code KRUG, K-R-U-E-G. And they will match you up to your first $100. And we're also brought to you by Sharp Corner Sports Cards and Collectibles. They're at 205 Cypress Avenue in Pacific Grove down in the Monterey Peninsula. If you're a card and collectible guy, go check them out. Or give Anthony Catania a call at 831-521-5264 for all of your collectible needs. Uh, We will have some additional sponsors joining the mix in the next week to 10 days. Very excited about that, but we won't talk about it just yet. You can't, you can't stop with the sponsors, Larry. What is it? I know to make money or something. I know. Seriously. It's, it's, it's an amazing thing, but, um, but uh, yeah, no, thank you to all the sponsors. And, and of course, uh, thanks to all the people in the chat. we got a loyal group of people in the chat that join us and, 
you know, the bottom line is um, I'm loving doing the YouTube thing. I mean, it's 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 been fantastic. Uh, we're sitting here a little bit over two years uh, in the space, and we're got closing in on four, we just past forty one thousand subs, a uh, million views a month. Um, you know, picking up a thousand subs a month, so it's it's going really good. It's awesome. Um, all right, let's get into the draft. But before we do, the first, the primary question around the Niners last year was about, you know, Trey Lance. Are they really going to trade him? I mean, who's the quarterback? Is it Trey? Is it Brock? What's yeah. the deal? Is it Sam? This year, the filibuster is tied to Brandon Ayuk, mm -hmm. and Ayuk did the, you know, so at this point, I would say cliche move yeah. of, you know, wiping his social media of the Niner content. Um, does it mean something? Does it mean nothing? You know, and, and here's the thing, just because it meant nothing for a previous player doesn't mean it means nothing for the current player. So yeah. it's not like we can just go, oh, well, Debo did this. This is the move he resigned. Um, Ayuk will resign. Yeah. But where are you on, on the Brandon Ayuk thing? Where do you think more importantly he is with the 49ers or maybe more, most importantly, where do you think the 49ers are with him? I just don't see this as anything that's outside of the ordinary yet. I, I just, there's no information that I can glean from anybody that gives me any indication that there is something nefarious or weird or different going on. This is just, they are literally doing the steps of the song and dance right now. The 49ers have one point of leverage in the entire negotiations because it's pretty obvious what you're going to have to pay Brandon Ayuk just based on the market. It's going to be $24, $25 million, $70 to $75 million guaranteed. They could hammer out those details in an afternoon if they wanted to. The issue that they have is the Niners don't actually have to re-sign him. They don't. He's under contract for another year. They can figure this out next year before he becomes a free agent or let him be a free agent and get in on the action. Franchise tag him. They can do a lot of stuff. They have that ability. So why would they rush this? Why would they go and take on some risk there's a little bit of risk and brandon Ayuk's going to work out this summer and one cut and he could tear his acl or, or pop a hammy or something so why take on that risk by paying him now when you'll just pay him before training camp as they have done time and time again because that forces the agent and the player to come to the table and be a bit more reasonable right now when there is no timeline constraint you can be as pie in the sky as you want you could say i want to be the highest paid receiver in the nfl no one can really stop you from saying that but the 49ers aren't going to pay him that. So it's the same song and dance. We've seen this with every receiver. You know how receivers are. The further away you are from the ball, the more you have to complain to get it. So this is something that's built into the system a little bit. Ayuk is a pretty low-key dude. He's just doing what he thinks you have to do to get the attention, to let people know, hey, you know, we want this new contract, to give any sort of pressure he can to the Niners. But the Niners are are going to be steadfast. If they wanted him gone, if they thought he'd be gone, he'd be gone by now because you can get a first round pick for him, I still think. And then they would want to be attacking the draft preparation in the final two weeks or probably more with understanding or with an understanding of what pick they had. They're not going to do some fly by night. Oh, we're going to trade Ayuk right before the draft. Like if he was if he was supposed to be gone, he'd be gone by now. If Debo Samuel was supposed to be gone, he'd be gone by now. They're going to ride forward. I think this thing gets sorted either a couple days before training camp or within the first week of training camp, and it's no harm, no foul. IU gets paid. Debo plays his last year for the 49ers under his current contract, and then he gets shipped out as to mitigate some of the cost issues that you have at that position. Brock Purdy gets his new contract. It'll probably be a somewhat similar song and dance, albeit different music for sure. And, uh, we just move forward with with the core that the Niners have, but that core includes Brock Purdy, and it certainly includes his number one receiver and his number one favorite target, Brandon Ayuk. You know, there's so many different thoughts that come to mind when you're when you're giving me that that answer, and I, you know, okay, a couple of them. One is the Niners are going to pay Brock Purdy fifty million dollars or somewhere close to that. That's yeah. a ton. Who if, if who's going away? You mm -hmm. know, of the guys that make money. Give me two or three that are going away because it's so easy to sit here as a fan and go, they're not moving Kittle. They're not moving Debo. They're not moving Ayuk. Mm -hmm. These guys are all really good. It's not even really about that anymore. It's about, it's a hard cap sport and you're going to pay Brock Purdy 
big, big money in a very, in, you know, next year. So you can wait till next year, you know, but like who's going away. I and mean, uh, if you the, were the running the one, show, who's the, the easiest guy to go away? One of them was Eric Armstead. Debo. I mean, Debo's gone. Debo's going away. He's gone. At the end of next this year, year, it becomes reasonable for you to do that. You, you trade. You, I mean, you, you, you hightail him. Uh, I think Trent Williams, with his constant threats of retirement, is a reasonable option. He might make this thing easy for you. This might be his last year just as a player anyway, because he was feeling it at the end of the year. Now, Eric Branch got to him a little early and maybe <laughs> cornered him and said, hey, are you going to retire this year? And he's like, nah. And then he gets into the playoffs and he's kind of getting his ass kicked a little bit. He did not have a good Super Bowl and he might have changed his mind. Now, I don't think that Eric Branch is holding <laughs> holding him to it, but uh, it, it is it is always a threat that Trent Williams is gone, which leads us sort of the mock draft down the line. Another name that I think people have to keep in mind for this, I mean, yes, Kittle obviously comes to the top of the list, uh, but CMC could also be a, an option to go away. You don't have the luxury of getting both a top wide receiver and paying really big money, more money to, than almost anybody, to a running back if you're going to pay your quarterback the big bucks. And we know that Kyle Shanahan thinks that he can do a lot, certainly not what CMC can do, but a lot with very cheap production at running back. So I think running back is going to be something they're really honed. I mean, I've heard straight up that running back is going to be something they're honed in on for day three. Hmm. Very interesting because really, if you're talking about who's going away, this, you know, that very much plays into the draft plans for yeah. 2024. So you got to kind of have that discussion and work back from there. Yep. Um, I don't, you know, it's hard to say about Trent because it's like he, um, is he going away? Is he not? How about Kittle? How about, you know, CMC? How about Debo? Um, you know, Ayuk would not be on the list of guys you'd want to get rid of because it seems like he's got four or five really good years coming up right now. So it doesn't yeah. seem like it makes sense to move him. Charvarius but then there's Ward's the, another name that, who, that Charvi like yeah, Mooney. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. He was great, obviously, last year, but, you know, you, you can maybe sell high in that situation. Mm. Something to think about. Um, okay. Then there's the, you know, the whole game plan from IUK's agent. We're going to wait till the market's set. We're going to wait till everybody signs. That really sounds like we want top money and we're going to try to dovetail under Justin Jefferson, mm -hmm. who's may get out there at $35 million a year. Yeah. And what if, what if all of a sudden, you know, the thing about the Niners under under uh, Parag Marate, who's their cap you know negotiator, they always seem like they have a number and they're pretty disciplined about staying with their number. Yeah. Um, and then the then the other you know the idea that you threw out initially, which is they don't have to do this right away. Yeah, no, they don't. But they should. do, do they <laughs> want to hold out? Do they want a guy sitting in the corner of the room who's one of the leaders who's mad about his deal? Do yeah. you want that all all that the, the distraction that goes into all of it. So I don't know that that I don't know that, like, you know, just make him sit and play on the fifth year option. No. That sound that sounds good on a talk show and it sounds good in a live stream. I don't know that it plays actually in the locker. No, room. no, it's bad news. And the Niners have made it principle. Their principle that they have is that they want to reward the guys who get it done for them and they want to pay them top dollar. Sometimes they pay them a little bit more. Now, they don't necessarily want to set the market at every position because not every player is worth setting the market for. But the guys who are close, they do it for them. And I think Ayuk is going to be somewhere just beneath that tier. You're talking Michael Pittman just got a $70 million contract. He's going to be above that. A.J. Brown got a $100 million contract. That might be the range, just with inflation and all that. Um, and, you know, you mentioned Prag Morath. It should be noted that the Niners have been a lot less disciplined about how they handle their salary cap structure, and that directly correlates with the time that the 49ers bought Leeds United and put Parag in charge of it. So uh, I, I don't know if this is uh, parents are away and the kids are out to play a little bit with John and Kyle, or if it's just strictly the entire organization saying, we got a Super Bowl window, attack, attack, attack because you have this quarterback who's effectively a rounding heir. But I, I know for a fact that Parag is not as involved in these discussions, for better and for worse, as he was just a couple of years ago when the base of this team was really put together in some of these bigger contracts that we're talking about now getting rid of in the future. We're, we've already gone through the full cycle of these contracts. He's a lot less involved in those conversations than he was uh, initially when he was really the head guy and uh, the point man for all of it.
you know, the other thing is wide receivers are probably of all these positions, maybe the easiest position to, to, you know, find guys. I mean, you could, it's unbelievable Larry. today. Unbelievable. You could sign Tyler Boyd. I mean, if you right. wanted, he, you could sign him, you could sign Chase Claypool. I mean, there's a bunch, there's five or six other guys out Think there. About Chris Conley. They've signed off the street the last two years. I'm not saying Chris Conley is some sort of game changer, but he's a really solid receiver. And I'm I'm just going through my list of receivers here. There are guys that are ranked 40, 45 in this draft class that I love. And yeah. not just in some sort of pie in the sky way. Like I think they could be like legitimately really good NFL players. I mean, a Puka Nakua type, just not maybe in output, but in impact in year one as a fifth round draft pick. There's never been a better there's never been a better crop of receivers. And I said that last year. And I said that the year before that. And I said that the year before that. The last five years for wide receivers with the way the college game is being played today is absolutely absurd. And it's ironic because at the same time, the money keeps going up for the NFL versions of them. At the same time, I feel like they're most expendable. And there will be uh, there will be a market correction at some point. Brandon Ayuk is going to be lucky and get in at the uh, at the last minute here before the market crashes. Cause I really do think it's going to crash. You, you can't have $30 million receivers when you can get a Javon Baker in the fourth round. Yeah. And another player I like did Dieter. Why is it though, that Devonte was traded and Diggs was traded and, and, you know, we, AJ Brown was traded and so yeah. many of these receivers in the last, you know, the last few years, uh, teams get to the price point and are like, ah, We'll trade them. Why are we seeing that as a trend? And we're not, and and it really is about wide receiver. I mean, we're not yeah. seeing lots of great players traded. We're seeing high profile wide receivers when they're about to get paid get pawned. Why? It, it's two, it's twofold, and one of them is what I just mentioned. The wide receiver classes are incredible. I think let's just break down what happened with Stefan Diggs because I think he is the perfect encapsulation of all of it. And I'm not talking about what just happened with him. I'm talking about what happened with him when he left the Minnesota Vikings and right. went to the Buffalo Bills. The Buffalo Bills had a quarterback who could not throw the ball accurately and whose only ability at the NFL, they found this out in the second half of Josh Allen's rookie year, was to run it. So they needed to go and get somebody who could just get the hell open and develop a one-on-one -on -one relationship at a very high level with their quarterback to see if that quarterback could work. And so they went out and they got Stephon Diggs and obviously changed the Buffalo offense immeasurably. Now we're at a point where the Buffalo Bills are looking at Stephon Diggs. He wants another contract. They're looking at the way he played this past season and saying, hell no, we're not signing you up for more of this. And they took on a big financial hit to trade him to Houston, where they have a young quarterback who, by the way, doesn't need the help, but they could they feel like they have an opportunity to make a push in the AFC South. They can afford to bring on a big contract player because they're not paying their quarterback. So they now bring in Diggs. It is a twofold factor of you do need guys who are established and proven at the NFL level to elevate your quarterback if your quarterback is cheap. A Debo Samuel is a great example. A Brandon Ayuk to a certain degree, not that he was significantly paid, but he was a first round pick, uh, is a good example of that. Go back to when Diggs left Minnesota. They went out and just got Justin Jefferson. And Justin Jefferson is, I think, inarguably at this juncture, a better receiver than Stefan Diggs was. They felt like they could replace him with ease. And you know what? Honestly, I think that Minnesota might want to roll the dice on that ball game again because the class is just so good, even better than it was with Jefferson. So um, it is a very strange market. But when you have a young quarterback, you need to put the guys around them. But if you are a Patrick Mahomes and you're going to pay this guy 40, 50 million dollars a year, well, now there are luxuries that you cannot afford. And the easiest one to divest yourself from is a wide receiver because, well, the they're great and all, but if you have a great quarterback, you don't really need a great wide receiver. That That's a champagne problem to have to pay both of them, but ultimately you can't. And so uh, that's what I'm seeing. You know, Devontae Adams gets traded to the Raiders. Why? He wanted big money. He deserved big money. They already had Aaron Rodgers. And, you know, they didn't know how long that was going to last, but they, they wanted to get out ahead of this so that they still had trade value for Devontae Adams. A.J. Brown, why did the Eagles get him? Because they wanted to see if Jalen Hurts was the real deal or not. Then he goes out and he is the real deal. Uh, you know, DK Metcalf, they, you know, I don't know what the hell's going on in Seattle. So that may be a bad argument, but Michael Pittman just gets paid. I don't think the world of Michael Pittman, I think he's a fine receiver. I, he's probably a fringe number one, a really good number two for me. But why'd the Colts pay him? Because they got to find out if Anthony Richardson's the real deal or not. And so this is the cycle 
that all of these teams are going through right now. Not every one of them uh, strict one to one, but uh, it, you got to have somebody that you can trust to get open. And then we can find out if your quarterback's good or not. If you got wide receivers who can't get open, how are we ever supposed to evaluate this quarterback at a high level? And so um, that's where I think everything is at. And ultimately, I don't think Brock Purdy needs that evaluation. I don't think he needs that help. So it's going to be an interesting dynamic, but you also don't want to scrap everything that you've built at wide receiver with Brandon Ayuk because you do have so many intricacies that other teams don't force their teams to do with blocking, some of the route running, some of the decoy stuff. It's a very high level that Kyle Shanahan demands from his receivers, and Brandon Ayuk does all of those things at a very high level. So I think Kyle is going to specifically be very reticent to get rid of Brandon Ayuk because, as we've seen before, you can't just teach someone to do this overnight. They had to go out and get Emmanuel Sanders to teach Debo Samuel how to do this. They made a trade so that another player could learn how to do it from someone that he would listen to instead of Wes Welker. They then get with Brandon Ayuk. It took him two years to figure it all out. The key word for Brandon Ayuk for his first few years was doghouse. And now he's out of it and he's going to get paid. He's going to go to the penthouse. But um, I think the Niners are a little bit more idiosyncratic than other teams with their receivers and that offense. So I, I do think they're going to pay Brandon Ayuk, even though I think the way that the market is going, it kind of tells you, you might not need to, you might not have to, I should say. And uh, we'll, we'll see how it all pans out. You know, it's about, do you want a disgruntled guy? Do you want a guy who's happy? Um, you know, I used to drink lucky loggers in, in college before I actually had got taste in beer. Yeah. Um, and part of it was we would sit there high as a kite trying to decipher the caps and stuff. Ah, oh, you know, yeah. I think it's a blah, 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 blah. We always had some idiot who was really good at it. Um, I feel like the, I, those skills, I should have tried harder at lucky logger caps when I'm trying to de decipher, uh, you know, NFL players, uh, cryptics, you know, messages yeah. on IG, but what did you make of the big dog and the big, you know, the big dog and the dog house? I mean, people were like, he wants to go to the Browns or he's going to be traded to the Browns. Other people are like, no, it's referring to Shanahan, putting him in the dog house. You know, and then there's the he's just not very good at this, is he? <laughs> like, that's the other thing. Like, there's some guy. Listen, I, I'm I, I have fully aged out of whatever is going on. I, I don't do social media like others. Like, I, I don't care. I just don't care. I'm not missing out on anything is what I figured out. But he's not going to the Browns. The Browns can't afford him. Uh, so let's cut that out right now. Brandon Ayuk is not very good at this. He, he He's not. This is not his foray. He is not this kind of guy where he, he's not a diva and we're coming into a new era of wide receiver divas. And it's really fun and incredible to watch because you know that the Niners don't really have a guy like that Debo to a degree, but Debo is now sort of aged out of it too. Brandon Ayuk is just following what other guys are doing and emulating them. And it, it just doesn't ring true. It comes across as phony and a guy who's trying too hard to play a game. That's generally pretty stupid and uh, undercutting of one's professionalism. So I, I don't care. Like, I just don't care because ultimately money talks and this is strictly, forgive my uh, French here, BS. All of this is BS. It's social media. It doesn't mean anything. It's just dudes it's spouting nonsense to an audience that doesn't give a damn about them and is looking to take them down. Like none of this, it's inherently empty and a hundred million dollars is the opposite of that. So when we get down to brass tacks, which we are clearly nowhere near, I think all this stuff goes away and it's ultimately forgettable for me because I don't have to engage in it now, which means I'm certainly not going to be thinking about it later when they actually have to get to the negotiating table and hash this thing out. What do you think of the talk that they're, you know, going to see how the first round goes and see if there's somebody, I mean, what, who, they, who, who would they trade him for? And then the other question is, are the Niners really, should they pay this guy just based on the fact of their utilization of the player? I mean, he doesn't get the ball. I mean, he he had a nice year this year, but he had three catches in each of the playoff games and three catches in the Super Bowl. Yeah. Is that worth nearly thirty million dollars? And it just seems like it. The answer to that is no. But yeah. um, you know, I, I like Ayuk, and I I want to see him stay because I think he's going to be good going forward. But um, this also. I mean, the Buckner Kinlaw thing did not work out. Why? Because Kinlaw didn't wasn't Buckner, and I think the Niners broke a cardinal rule, which is you never trade a player who commands a double team on your front seven. Period. 
End they of story. Also, they also broke the cardinal rule of taking a player at the same position as the player they just replaced with the draft pick. So right. it's just the easiest one-to-one -one comparison ever. And so right. he had to be DeForest Buckner or better, which right. he's never going to be because DeForest Buckner's a good player. Right. Buckner was a great, great player. And and Kinlaw obviously had physical problems and never and really became... They also became... paid Eric Armstead, who was a five technique, to play as a three technique. And that, you know, never really worked out. So, I mean, they made, they've made mistakes. They're not infallible. Oh, no question. They and... traded three first-round picks for Trey Lance. Clearly, they're capable of making mistakes. Oh, I mean, their their track record. I mean, they took Reuben Foster in the first round. They took Solomon Thomas in the top five. I mean, they've had they took Mike McGlinchey, who's a mediocre right tackle, like he yeah. was a left tackle in the top ten. That's right. I mean, they've made all kinds of mistakes. They're more known for their mistakes than their successes as far as the first day or two of the draft. I mean, outside of Bosa, which was the second pick overall. And the most pick obvious pick it, in the history. Of yeah, I mean, that pick made itself, you know. I mean, right. in the Debo pick, I mean, they've swung and missed a ton. And yeah. only these late round saves of Kittle and Purdy and, mm -hmm. you know. Fred somebody, Warner in the third Fred, round. Fred Warner, DJ Jones early on. Three only more. those day three, sal you know, saves. Yeah have made them, um, you know, avoid criticism. They now have extensions. They're viewed yep. as heroes. Um, and we're going to find out, you know, how important was Adam Peters. But yes. is there a player, like Grant Cohn had a thing today, hey, they should trade him to New England because New England can afford him, and okay. they should take New England's high second and high third and okay. get down the road. Now, that's it. That's, that's right interesting. In that's good in theory. Um, and, and, and to me, at least, at least that's a fair trade. Yeah, as far as you know, that I think that that's probably a doable trade. Yeah. Um, but is there a player that you think if we get to the middle of the first round and we get to the Jacksonville, Pittsburgh, you know, um, there's several teams that may want Ayuk right there in the middle of the first round or, you know, mm -hmm. we'll say between 10 and 25 or something like that. If if a player that they like falls there, will they pull the trigger on an Ayuk trade to get that pick? Um, or will they try to comp their picks and, you know, group them together and, and trade up for that, for that pick? Who is the player yeah. that you think they're eyeing on a potential, you know, day one draft day fall? They are, um, not pretending anymore, right? There's a lot of smoke screens and nonsense. And I always have maintained that you lock in what you know on April one and you, just ignore everything else from that point on. Um, you could push it maybe a little bit, but we get to crazy smokescreen nonsense, putting out information that's false just to see how people react to it stuff. And the Niners are very buttoned up, but it, they still push out stuff in good circles. And so uh, they're going for an offensive tackle early. They're going for one early. And I, the way that this first round shakes out, I just don't see one falling to them that they're going to really love. So they're probably going to have to move. If they want a guy who has legitimate first round talent, um, they can may maybe stay at 31 and overdraft somebody. We'll talk about him later. Uh, or they can get into that some range between 15 and 24, which is where I think the final run of tackles is going to be. I don't think you t touch Brandon Ayuk as it pertains to moving up to those spots though. Like I, I just, I, 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 I again, if they wanted to move him, if they really felt like, hey, we can we can replace him in the short term or <laughs> to go full money ball in the aggregate. Like if we can <laughs> replace him, he'd be gone. He'd be gone by now because this is a team that, I mean, it was a mistake in how it was fully executed. But this is a team that traded up three first round picks to go to number three so that they could evaluate quarterbacks like they are not. If there's anything about this front office that people need to know, it's that they are very detailed. Now, that doesn't always bring about the best results, as we have seen. Sometimes it does. But they are very detailed. They don't do anything by their gut. I'm not saying they're a full analytics department, Farhan Zaidi, anything like that. But they do their homework at a high, high level. And they feel very, very confident when they make their picks about um, how that should go for them. If they didn't want Brandon Ayuk on this team, or if they thought that they could do better than Brandon Ayuk, or if they wanted to reshuffle something, they would have done it already. Ultimately, this team very much believes that they have a two-year window here where they can win the Super Bowl, and they're not looking to move off of top talent, guys that they think are every-down players, which they didn't think Eric Armstead was going to be for them this upcoming season because of his injuries and because of his ineffectiveness in the run game. 
um, they 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 are they're not going to move off it. This would have been the time to move off of Debo. You get out of it, you get out ahead of it. You do it a year early, and you still have a trade market for him. Next year, they're going to find that the trade market, even if he has an awesome year, is going to be very limited because of the tread on the tires. And you're not going to get what you think you should get for a player like Debo Samuel. Um, I, I don't know. You know, Brandon Ayuk, second and a third makes sense. A late first makes sense. I don't know if those match up on the Belichick or Jimmy Johnson trade chart or whatever, but it all makes sense in my head. So let's go with that. Um, they would have done it already. They would have already have made the move. The Houston Texans are sitting there at 21. They just went and got Stefan Diggs. You don't think they would have wanted Brandon Ayuk? They would have actually re-signed him. They would have kept you know, you don't think D'Amico knows what Brandon Ayuk's about. So well, my, um, my old theory is what if they look, you know, Brock Bowers is from Napa. Uh yeah. he he's a great tight end. I mean, he really is. I mean, he mm-hmm. probably could go top five and he may go top ten. A lot of people think he's going nine to the Jets or whatever. Um, 14 to the Saints, if I had to make a guess. But yeah. yeah, but there's a chance with Penix and Bo Nix mm-hmm. and some of the, you know, the, the teams that really go for need that he could get pushed down the board. And if you told me Brock ba- Brock Bowers went five, I wouldn't be shocked because I think he's a top five guy in this draft. But if you okay. told me he went 22, I wouldn't be shocked either because it's tight end and and not everybody, you know, tight ends occasionally will fall. I think he might be a guy that they're eyeing as just a, you know, and the other guy that I think they could be eyeing, and I was talking to Brian Baldinger the other day, is uh, Cooper DeGene from yes, Iowa, who could so. be a, an impact guy at, at safety or corner. Um, or and, nickel. I love, I yeah, or love nickel. the concept of him at nickel. Yeah. And, 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 uh, and they, they want to move, they want to move, fan. Uh, they want to move Lenore outside again. Why? I don't know, but they, they are keen on moving Lenore outside and, uh, they're looking to, to add a nickel in this draft. Now there's some guys that they can get day two, day three, but the best nickel in this draft, and it's not even particularly close, is Cooper DeGene. Now, the issue is I'm not sure he's going to be there for you at 31, much less where you really want to take. And then are you going to take a nickel in the first round? Are you going to trade up for a nickel? He might be the exception to prove the rule, which is, yeah, no. I, I would say that if you said to me, what are the Niners' number one need? Tackle. I would say great player. Valid. They need a great player. Valid. It doesn't yes. matter what position. they. Like you said, hey, they need an offensive tackle. I think yeah. they need a great offensive lineman. That's right. Like, That's I don't right. think I'd rather take, a, you know, Frazier from the center from West Virginia because I think he's a great center. Really? Than like, than the the Arizona uh, Jordan I'm Morgan, Morgan. Offense, Yeah, I'm not with a Morgan. the short arms and kind of the limited upside. I I don't think I mean because they're to me they got a game week one and That's right. they're going to start Trent Williams and Colton McKivitz at tackle. That's right. Um, you, you can survive I, on that. They just did. Yeah, I, I just think they need a. Whatever spot they go, they just brought in Michael Hall from Ohio State. I think he's a great player. He he led the nation this year in pass rush win rate. You know, he there's bigger, stronger guys. He's about 290, but you know what? He rushed the passer at a high level. So I just think yeah. they need to hit. They need to hit. They yeah. need to they need to find a player who's one of the top five players on their roster next year. Um, mm. at the at the top of this draft. They need to find a great player. It, it, preferably a great corner or a great D tackle right. or a great offensive tackle or That's a great right. interior offensive lineman or a great receiver. They need to find a great player well, what, over what, everything else. You know the rules, Larry. Day uh, day one pick needs to be a per, someone who produces for you on day one. They need to be an impact player on day one. A day two pick means that they got to have a role for it, this team. Top 100, you got to have a role. Now that might just be situational pass rusher, but you got you got to have a role. And then day three, that's when we're talking about guys who either have the athletic upside or they had the production in college that doesn't make any sense given their athletic scores. But hey, they can play football. And sometimes it's just as easy as that. A Jawan Jennings is a great example of that. A uh, Brock Purdy is a great example of that. Um, for, uh, George Kittle, no production in college, incredible athletic freak. They rolled the dice, but that's what you do on day three. You roll the dice. You understand you're going to hit with some. You're not going to hit with others. And you're looking for that big jackpot at the craps table. Um, so a hundred percent, the first rule of the first round is you better have somebody who is going to be a big time player for you. Now at 31, that gets a little bit tricky. And I also think that certain draft classes define what it is you have to do with your picks. You can say, Hey, we can hold off at this position because 
We really like the options that we have available to us in the third, fourth, and fifth rounds. We don't have to go and get a guy early on because, hey, he's part of this top tier. With offensive line, there are six, maybe seven tackles plus a guard or two. So, hell, it might be 10, who I think could reasonably go in the top 25. And after that, there is a big gap. Day two shouldn't have very many tackles taken unless the draft goes a different way than I expect. Uh, With positional um, importance these days, with tackle, I I can't imagine that we're looking at a a situation where you have a lot of guys going in the second and the third round. I think teams are going to get their tackles done early, and that puts the onus on the 49ers to not wait around and hope everything works out for them. If they're there at 31, they might have to move up to get the guy that they want, and they might have to stretch a little bit and get a guy who's maybe more of a second-round grade at 31 because it fits there. Because if they wait, I think they're going to find themselves in a world of hurt. It's an exceptional tackle class, but only at the top. You know, I, 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 this is, I'll push back on this one. I kind of disagree. I, I, I really love, um, you know, and, and we'll see how they view it. You know, I mean, yeah. as far as plug and play, yeah, I mean, I think there's only a few guys up top, but I like some of these guys down below. I like Garrett Greenfield from South Dakota State. I like right. Ladarius Henderson from Michigan. I really like Javon Foster from your school, Missouri. That's right. He's a little, uh, he dumb. had a, but yeah. he had a he had he's got the longest arms in the dra- of the any tackle right. in the draft I believe or at least he's close to it for them too and it was great at the Senior Bowl um, right. you know and I think there's some decent guys I like the Maryland kid late there's mm-hmm. a guy from the HBCU named Anim Dakwa Donkwa from mm-hmm. Howard who's six eight three sixty and very much looks a lot to me like uh, Day One Jones from a year ago but That's they're good. they're not plug and play like guys a, these I are like all developmental Crum. guys. Crumb, from the Wyoming. big ginger from uh, yeah. Wyoming, yeah, he's um, and and there's a couple others in the, on that list as well that that probably but those, uh, are, those are dice rolls. A lot of those Caden are dice Wallace. Rolls. Yeah, and right and now then, you're looking at an offensive line where your left tackle, who's the best in football or, or is a certain Hall of Famer, could retire at any minute, and you don't have a lot. You can't slide Colton McKivitz over there. You can't just do that. And you'd like to replace Colton McKivitz and have him as your swing tackle in an ideal world. So you need to bring in somebody who can halfway through the season at the very least give you snaps if McKivitz isn't getting it done and who in theory could rise up and be your franchise left tackle starting in 2025. And I just don't think that you can do that in the second round and beyond. I think that has to be a first round option. And I think yeah, the Niners I mean, think that that's what they're telling people. Well, and history says you're right, too. I mean, most top, top tackles come in the top 25 picks. To me, the only guys that you could that you could plug and play would be Alt, Fuaga, Fashanu, Latham, yep. Fatanu, yep. and then I'll go with Tyler Guyton. The rest of the guys, Mims, Morgan, uh, the BYU did kid, you say, Patrick did you say Paul. Latham? Sorry. I don't know. Yeah, Latham. I like Latham yeah. a lot. Though, you know, I've got a, 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 a scouting buddy who called me last week and said, Krug, I've been watching your stuff. I think Latham's a guard. And so we'll see. He, he's not okay. a left tackle. He's a right tackle, but he's got enormously strong hands. I think in some ways Latham is the prototype right tackle. And, and, and I think that would be a dream selection if he fell. So we'll see. Everybody's got, you know, this is where this, that's the beauty of the draft. Yeah, Everybody's right. got the guy they like or don't like. All right. And let's some of the guys that we're to... certain are going to be good are going to suck. And some of the guys right. we're certain are going to suck are going to be good. I mean, it's, it's all very nuanced. It's, and it's a it's, lot of fun. People evaluating people is going to be failure ridden. <laughs> and it's just Especially the way it is. Just, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Especially when it's us. Um, okay. Quickly, before we get to your, your mock, this is what I yeah. see the Niners needs as. I don't think they need a receiver. If they if they bring back Ayuk and stay with the the current crop, I think they're deep enough at receiver. I think that's kind of a low priority. Um, it would be nice to grab another receiver, but I don't think it's a necessity. I think this is an opportunity with the way this draft is shaped um, to really build your offensive line from the center to the to the right guard to the right tackle and yeah, really this one. really yeah. build. I mean, I would be fine if they took three offensive linemen in this draft. Tight end, I think, is a primary need. You got George Kittle and a, just a bunch of dudes. That's right. um, uh, quarterback, not so much. Running back, I think, is a need. Why? Because, as you said, McCaffrey, you know, McCaffrey had close to 400 touches last year. 
That's and right. obviously they don't trust Mitchell. He's got a, you know, he's a small guy. He runs upright. He runs between the tackles. They obviously Every time he plays a game. He misses two. I mean, it's really yeah, Jordan wild. Mason. They clearly, there's not a lot of belief there. They can say what they want. I think running back is a need. Yeah. I think defensive line is a need. Uh, you know, I like, I, I like Malik Collins and I like, uh, um, I'm a big Jordan Elliott fan. I mean, he played at your school, Missouri. I think there's a lot there. I love the Leonard Floyd signing. But I still think they need one more impactful guy, both at tackle and on the edge. No doubt. I think they need one linebacker with no green law, unless Jalen Graham is really going to come on. And I think even he still. will come on. Yeah. But so. there's, there's, you know, Ezekiel Turner's a special teamer. Flanagan Fowles is a special teamer. Curtis Robinson's a special teamer. I mean, half their linebacking core can't play from scrimmage. That's right. So they need one more starting caliber uh, linebacker. Right. I think they don't need corner depth, but they do need a great corner. Um, and if they, they, nickel. And they can, and a nick, a nickel corner would be nice, but if they could find a true number one corner, I would like that because I think Mooney's probably going to get, be one of the guys that gets priced out. That's so right. corner. And then I think they have a severe need at, at safety. I mean, Jair is a free is, is lined up to play free safety. I don't think he's a good free safety. I think, okay. I think uh strong safety is where Hafanga and Brown both sit and the rest okay. of the guys are just guys. I mean, yeah, I mean, um, they, they gave George Oda $5 million and yet they were signing two dudes off the street to play safety instead of him last year. So, yeah. So there's a lot in my mind, there's still kind of a lot of needs, even though they were in the Super Bowl and so on and so forth. Well, they right, were not let's a get... team, Larry. Like they, they, their no. entire issue was that they didn't have any depth, and it, it, I don't think that's the thing that burned them in the Super Bowl. But it certainly didn't help them as they got towards the Super Bowl. So let's run down your mock draft, and then we'll do yeah. a quick one and get out of here. One is in the first round, you have the Niners trading from 31 to 15 and taking Troy Fatanu from the University of Washington, who looked just awesome at the Senior Bowl. And if you watched him with the Huskies this year, he's just a great player. The, the reason I like Fatanu, and I may like him in some ways the most for the Niners, is because you can play him at right guard, left guard, right tackle, left tackle, and I think he's kind of ready to roll. Um, and I love the speed, the explosion. I don't know that he's an ideal body type for tackle. I think he's probably a right or a left guard, but he could be a pro bowl right or left guard. True. And I think he might be the most ready to play of almost all the tackles, uh, including alts. I think this guy kid's really ready to play. Tell us about, about this pick. So first off, it would be the Niners trading. And I, I tried to be realistic about this. It'd be trading 31 and 94, their first and their third round picks. I'll tell you one thing. If you want to make a guarantee, I'll make a guarantee right here. The Niners will not pick at number 124. That's the pick that they got for Trey Lance. They will not, under any circumstances, use that pick to take another player because they, the Kinlaw rule with Buckner. They cannot have a player now be appreciably worth three first round picks because that's all they got for, for uh, Trey Lance. So 124 is going somewhere. But it, it, whoever's taken with that pick is not coming to San Francisco. And then 176, and then that gets uh, in next year's third round, and that gets them up to 15. The reason that I think 15 is the play, I you know I talked to some folks with the Colts that that they're open to doing some business, right? They they are in a position where they feel good. They like a lot of their options at 15. There are some you know, players that they have circled. If they're not there at 15, they're not moving up. So they might want to move down. Now, 31 is pretty rich. They might want to bounce back up after that. But I do think 15 is on the board. And 15 is an important spot because it jumps you in front of two teams in your division, the Rams and the Seahawks. And I know both of those teams are looking very hard at tackles. So if you want to go out and get your guy at tackle, you're probably going to have to jump one, if not both of them, to get it done. And if that means you got to toss in an extra pick or two, so be it, because you have to firmly believe this is your guy. I am very much of the mindset that Fautanu can play tackle. I think he can play right tackle day one, replacing Colton McKivitz if you want. And I think that down the line, he can be your starting left tackle because of his 81 and a half inch wingspan. I know that there's a couple of guys who are sort of labeled as guards and this. When you got those crazy long arms, he's like effectively six foot nine, six foot 10 with those crazy long arms. I think that you can make up for having an inch or two 
deficiency with his overall height. Um, as Invader 49er says, I, the Seahawks are all over Fautano. He was in their backyard. They know what he's about. This was the best offensive line in college football this past season. This dude is a road grader. He moves. He is smooth. He is mean. He is exactly what you want in an outside zone system. You just think about all those plays with Trent Williams breaking out, leading for Christian McCaffrey, leading for Debo Samuel on a screen. Fautanu immediately slides in and can do that at an elite level, at the NFL level. Um, and and you don't he covers you this year in a way that the other guys don't. In that right. any guy that goes down, you gotta you know if you didn't start I, him right I, away, you could have him as your first offensive lineman. He's your swing tackle. He's your swing guard. He could be your backup center. Like I love Mims, the uh, tackle out of Georgia, but Mims needs a year. They need that him and Chris Forrester need to spend every minute together for a year so that he can learn to play left tackle. And with that, well, and frame, you don't want to get Brock Purdy killed whilst Mims is learning his craft. That's right. And you, it's a first round pick, right? So the principle is he has to have an impact for you on day one. And Fautanu, who is probably, I don't know if he'll go this high, but I do feel very strongly that you need to get ahead of the Seahawks to get him. And I do think that the Rams are going to be all over them because, again, the Rams know exactly what it is the 49ers do. They do a lot of the same stuff. They have a lot of the same guys high on the draft board that other teams don't value. I just think that 15 has to be the spot to get Fautanu. I like Kingsley Sluamatia out of BYU. I think he's still a project. I think that you can maybe wait at 31 and maybe get him, but I don't think he's going to have that day one impact for you, though he's probably more ready than Mims without as high of a ceiling, though a pretty high ceiling. But uh, I went with Fautanu because I, I think that he is just the be all to end all. I really, really, really like him as a tackle. And you're right. You know, he, he, a lot of people see him as a guard. I think that's only a positive, but I, I think he can be your left tackle of the future without question. And certainly a very high end level right tackle. And at the very worst case, you got a starting guard or center. So yeah, hell no, yeah. he he's good. There's no question. And, and that would be a good pick. My only question about, and it has nothing to do with the Niners. It's more about Seattle and the Rams. I kind of see Seattle and the Rams maybe in that spot for Penix or Knicks or a quarterback. We'll see. We'll it's see. Not a lot there's a buzz a... around that right now. That might just be silence, but yeah. it, it doesn't it doesn't seem as if Penix is going to go in round one. Now maybe someone wants to jump to 31 and get that fifth year option. That's something the Niners will have to consider if they stay there. Uh Knicks is his star is fading. JJ McCarthy hype is fading a little bit. I, I'm not sure there's going to be a run on quarterbacks like we thought there was going to be about a month ago. Okay, so now let's get to your second pick because this one also is somewhat controversial. Yeah. At pick 63, this is their pick at the end of round two. You have them taking the one technique to Vondre right. Sweat, the yeah. big defensive tackle out of out of Texas, who just had the DWI. Now, I mean, DWI, come on, you know that that's a societal it's, thing, and it's like it's a. I'm not, not going to sit there and pretend yeah. that this kid is like evil incarnate because, he's uh, stupid. you know, he's he, dumb. he made a mistake. Um, yeah. But, you know, I, he's he's a huge bodied guy. Uh, if you watched Wait, him, 93 360. for Texas, he played inside. He's just he's a true one technique. He's from Huntsville, yeah. Texas. He's a senior. I uh, six four three sixty. The Niners have not had. A, a real, I mean, if you really want to say what is the ideal combo next to Javon Hargrave, I kind of agree with you. I think it's a one technique. Now, I'd rather go McKinley Jackson, but I'm an AM fan. I, I, <laughs> and I, I love McKinley Jackson. I'm with you on McKinley Jackson. I didn't think that Sweat, I don't think that Sweat should be there. Now, there are some people who look at Sweat and say he's a third or a fourth round pick. He's won I'm, the Outland Trophy, though. I mean, we're talking the about best player. He was the best player in the Big Twelve last year, I think, at any position. Um, yeah, I mean, this guy won the Outland Trophy, which is the interior award of 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 consequence, you know. And it's a sneaky and, good DT draft, though. Like sneaky good. Like yeah. I really love Johnny Newton, um, Rook Aroro. I think would yeah. be my guy. He's not going to be there at sixty three. He's going between forty and sixty. Um, yeah. There's just no I'm question sure. about it. Um, Crumley. Crumdy, Crumdy, Mississippi State. Yeah, well, which, which is, there. you know, that might be the best school at Purdue. I mean, who are the best defensive tackles in the game today? You could argue it's Jeffrey Chris Simmons Jones. and Chris yeah. Jones. They Where both they came go? out of Mississippi State. Starkville produces this position, and Crumdy's a big athletic kid. Yeah, I think uh, he's probably much going much later. 
I agree. Um, agreed. But like Braden Fisk would be, I think, a perfect fit for what Chris Kosarek likes to do. He's going to be gone. So yeah. if the Niners want to move up, and now you've moved up twice. I mean, I, I don't know how much capital you have to move up again. Uh, that's fine. I do. This this is more, you know, some of these are very specifically stuff I'm hearing from the Niners, more specifically stuff I'm hearing from other teams about the 49ers. And uh, some of this is wish casting to a degree. I think the Niners need a one technique. I think they need, you know, their run defense deteriorated last year. It deteriorated. Because, is not good against the run. No. And I, you know, I, everyone you brought in does not fix that problem. You have brought in, you have a bunch of three techniques and one of them is going to have to play one technique. And the issue is they're just going to run at that guy again and again and again. You need someone who might not have that burst that Chris Kucerich loves off the line, but can hold the damn line in the middle. And if you can get somebody like Sweat, who is visually jarring to see move, he is such a, he, he's not a freakish athlete. Some of these numbers are not crazy. Like he doesn't just have think, any, look at it but this he's way. Just such a it, beautiful football player. Just he, take the he, big fella. He, you know, we've all been to Hawaii. Uh, he's the big island. You That's know, right. he, he's the big island. He's he, he's just a, he in a lot of ways is the ideal guy to put next to Hargrave. Hargrave shoots gaps. My only question is kind of a more of a philosophical question. Is defensive line in the NFL kind of like at the NBA right now where mm. you can't have a non shooter on the floor because they don't guard him? Can you have a non rusher on a D line? You know, I've seen teams against Jonathan Hankins and, you know, they just they just sag in the middle and let that guy combo block and let Hankins just sit there because there's no pass rush ability at all. I'm with you. Are we in an era now, Dietz, where where every guy on the fr on your lines got to be able to rush the passer? I mean, that was the thing. DJ yeah. Jones was awesome against the run, but he had a little scoot. He had a little ability to move right. Does sweat, have an ability to to put any heat on the quarterback, or is he solely run deep? This guy moves so well for a man who weighs 366 pounds. Now, does he have the moves? Does he have, he'll get in the backfield. He'll get in the backfield. Maybe not enough to get the quarterback and maybe not as an elite pass rusher, but he's going to get a lot of tackles for loss. And that's just a little bit of a separate. That's a two yard gap. He's going to chase dudes down. I mean, it, it's like, Yes. To answer your question specifically, yes, he has enough juice. I wouldn't have considered him anywhere if he didn't have juice. There's a lot of meatballs at defensive tackle in this class. There's a lot of guys who weigh 280 pounds where it's like, well, what, what the hell position are you going to play in the National Football League? I mean, the Niners just worked out Evan Anderson this week from FAU. He weighs like 368 or something like that. Can't move. Can't yeah. move. He's a meatball. Like, listen, I love a meatball. Don't get me wrong. But like... uh it's not it's not reasonable to have that guy in the middle. I, I'm still stunned. Derek Brown, the Carolina Panthers defensive tackle who came out of Auburn, I'm stunned he got a second contract, much less one as big as he did because he's all hands and no movement. And, you know, like Carolina can pay him if they want. He did have a really nice year this past year, and they needed yeah. someone to take on. They need somebody he's to been take productive. on a damn double team. He's been good. Yeah. He's been very good. I'm just saying he's almost the exception that proves the rule. One technique's do have to have some scoot. They have to have some ability to get into the backfield. If you, if you look at some of these numbers on on sweat and you go, I don't know, I don't know. He might just be a meatball. He might just be a big fat fella in the middle, and he, that's what he's getting by on. I recommend you watch any Texas game. Pick one, pick any down, and watch him go to work because this guy has a motor, and this guy really he moves at an exceptional level for a big man. They used him as a tight end, oftentimes last year. Both of the Texas guys, I think, just crazy athletic. Five star, it play, and it plays into the Niners. The Niners like smaller, faster linebackers. You got to keep their legs free. I mean, you ask ask right. Fred Warner and Dre Greenlaw how important it is to, you know, not have the offensive lineman climbing to that second level. I mean, that's really what happened in the Green Bay and the Detroit game. Is their O lineman climbed to the second level? and uh, picked off linebackers, and the Niners had no way to stop it. And when you can't stop the run, guess what you're getting? The run all and, day long. And, and you think about the teams that have, you know, that's the way that the Packers and the Lions beat the 49ers is they ran the 49ers offense. Yeah, right? They ran all the same stuff that the Niners run up front. 
And what's the teams that always give the 49ers trouble when they play them? It's teams with a big mauler in the middle. Even if most teams in the league shouldn't actually be employing these guys, it's somebody who can take on two. I'm not saying Al Woods is coming back or anything, but somebody who can just demand a double team, like a DeForest Buckner back in the day, changes everything for a Nick Bosa on one side. It actually gives you one-on-one opportunities with Javon Hargrave. And right. uh, they, it, they helps, just, it stretches out your line. You can't you know? have an entire defensive line predicated on getting in between offensive linemen. Not not in this era and not with the proliferation of the wide outside zone. Yeah. Um, Alive Insurance is Larry apparently does not remember Alden Smith. My point is every guy who gets a DWI is not Alden Smith. And, I can and tell, Alden I, I've Smith known was, Alden Smith for a long time. I've known Alden Smith since he was 18 years old. Trust me. And, and I don't I know if interviewing Alden Smith. Different. He was a smart guy, but he was troubled. He was troubled. He had Deeply. lots of troubles, lots of demons that he that he was he working through. Twenty year old Dieter. I was writing all about it. Yeah, yeah. Seriously, Dieter went to the University of Missouri. Um, I blocked Alden Smith. Trust me, I don't forget. I, I haven't forgotten him. Yeah, I mean, and the, I mean, I remember shaking his hand the first time I met him, and I was like, "Jeez, this guy is he just wants a prototype." A, he once did a standing backflip with a broken leg for me. Oh, I mean, the guy, the guy was everything you wanted. All right. Now let's get to pick 132. You have them going Tanner Bordellini, yeah. a center from Wisconsin, who they have met with. Yep. Um, so you like Bordellini. Tell me what you like about Bordellini. He moves. He's smooth. He's looking for something on the second level. He's somebody you can, you can move in space. And I think he anchors very well for a player who has those kind of graceful feet. Um, I think that that is fundamental to that position for the 49ers. They have always valued, and I think they've been best when they've had more mobile centers. Um, having someone in the middle who can maul makes a lot of sense, right? You feel good about it. You're never worried about that interior pressure. I can understand if the Niners wanted to change up their game plan, but ultimately Jake Brendel is fine. Jake Brendel is going to be an issue on this. I think Bordellini anchors better than Brendel. I think he moves as well as him. You do have some concerns about his snaps, but I, I, Bordellini was a guy who my my podcast co-host Jake Hutchinson and I sort of identified about two and a half months ago as this is a guy who we think is going to get some buzz around him. And he went from a sixth round pick to a fifth round pick to a fourth round pick. And now he's pretty clearly in the, the third round, fourth round area locked in because a lot of teams, at least the ones that you know, I talk to, are are buying into what he has been selling so far in this draft process and just watching him on film. So. They need to, as you said, not just get a tackle, but they need to get an interior offensive lineman as well. I think that you're okay at guard, right? You're okay at guard for this upcoming season. You could do better, of course. You could always try to upgrade. I think that they might be in for a world of pain if Jake Brendel goes down or if Jake Brendel just deteriorates in any way. He, he's going to be on the back end of his career here. I think you need to have somebody who can slide in at guard today and be your center of the future moving forward. And uh, I think Bordellini has a lot of traits that Kyle Shanahan really values. He's also just whip smart. And you know Kyle wants that on the field because that's what he loves so much about Brock more than anything else. And I think it's something he's really valued with his centers, even going back to Ben Garland um, back in the day. like He just wants somebody who understands everything that's happening on the field, can get his offensive line into the right protections. Uh, you're never going to have to worry about that with Bordellini. This is a guy who turned down Yale. Got you know 4-0 GPA, 30 something on the ACT. He's he's whip smart. He's a mean ass. Yeah, yeah, gets academic to the second all level. Big Ten. And, and, and they'll tell and you in the a, Big Ten academics matter, you know. This is a big yeah. deal. Well, and he's got a awesome mullet. I mean, if you it's you important. Know, this is deep. You, you have got, to have a couple of mullets on the offensive line in this day and age. Yeah. I'll tell you, there it's a good center, it's a good center group this year. Um, I I, I like Bordellini quite a bit. I really like Bo Limmer, who's kind of a tall a good center. Option. He's six yeah. five from Arkansas. Yeah. Cedric Van Pran from Georgia, I think is pretty underrated. I love Zach Frazier. A lot of people think Graham Barton and Jackson Powers Johnson are are, you know, future all pro type guys. You spent any time I, with uh, Dylan McMahon at, at NC State? No, but I love I'd that recommend. program. I'd, I'd yeah, recommend I, him. I, I think I think he's a really good option, sixth, seventh round, maybe really? free agent. Yeah, I think he's yeah, a good and option. I'll, you know, and and um, 
you know, the, they, the Niners have a great offensive line coach in Chris Forster, yeah. so they could take a developmental player. The one thing that was really discouraging, I like Brendel. I think he's smart. He was a Pro Bowl alternate two years ago, but he just got absolutely dominated by DJ Reader in that Cincinnati game. Yeah. And at 280, 285, you know, I just think that he's a little underpowered. You know, I had I had uh, Baldy on, and I was asking him about Frazier from West Virginia, and he was yeah. saying that means that some of the people that he talked to said that Frazier could plug and play and start right away for them. But he that. made a great point. He's and now Grant and Baldy does a lot of stuff for the Eagles. He's watched Jason Kelsey, but he said, you know what, you can't have. And this is an interior offensive lineman in, in his own oh, way. Yeah. He oh, said, yeah. you can't have a great offensive line without having a great center. True. And that is a such a interesting thing. And I kind of, if you think about some of the greatest teams, uh, you know, Mike Webster with the Steelers, and you think of Dwight Stevenson with the Dolphins, and you think of Stepnoski in the early 90s, an undersized guy, but a great center with Dallas. And you think some of the 49er teams with Randy Cross. I mean, you got to have got to have Bart Oates. I mean, you got to have a great center. You got to have a great Creed center Humphrey. if you're going to have a great line. <laughs> Creed Humphrey right now with with uh, KC, no question. You got to have a great center. And we could probably find, you know, 10 or 12 other examples probably that would fit that mold. But I think oh, I yeah. really do believe in that. Let's go to the next pick. You have at 135 a very interesting back, a guy that I really love, Tyrone Tracy. Um, and yeah. I, I don't watch tons of Purdue football. But I saw this guy in the All Star game, and then I went and watched his highlight film, and then I went and watched Purdue a couple times. This is a converted wide receiver. Uh, this would give the Niners kind of a different look. Talk about Tracy and what you like about him. You have him going one thirty five to the Niners. I like him as a receiver more than I like him as a running back. I think he's a really good running back. Um, this is a very specific sort of moonshot play, and at one thirty five, I would have liked it a little, little lower. But this is a guy who now I'm, I'm here and has some buzz. I can tell you firsthand the Rams really like him. And um, this is at your low level, your Ray Ray McLeod replacement. I don't think that he is necessarily going to be um, a guy that you want to stick in the backfield a lot, but he has the ability to go into the backfield. And that makes him a possible, possible, I have to put on all the caveats and makes him a possible Debo replacement in your offense. If nothing else, because of the versatility, you will lose versatility either through getting rid of McCaffrey or Debo Samuel in the future. You are going to need to replace it to maintain the dynamicism of your offense. Tyrone Tracy Jr. is nothing if not a dynamic player. As a wide receiver, he's really good on those crossing routes. He's a really good yak guy. He's somebody that you get the ball to and you let him do his work. He's going to be a great punt and kick returner. That's something you need to replace because it ain't Ronnie Bell, baby. And then you look at him in the backfield, it's one cut and go. That's the Kyle Shanahan motto through and through. And he made some really good defenses look really slow in the Big Ten this last year. I'm not someone who believes that the Big Ten actually was the best defensive conference in football. Uh, I think a lot of that was just having shitty offenses around them. But, but. He made, he made even Michigan at times look really slow. I think Tyrone Tracy Jr. is a game changer and a game breaker, and I think Kyle Shanahan could have a lot of fun with him as a gadget player early, maybe developing into something more down the line. And then again, at the very least, you're getting yourself a bona fide quality punt and kick returner. We know punt returning is important. No one's ever questioned that. Kick returning is going to be more important this upcoming year than perhaps ever before. you got to have someone you can trust and that can make a play for you back there. Tyrone Tracy Jr. at 135, a little rich compared to where I was at a couple of weeks ago, but I don't think the 49ers can afford, even with this great wide receiver class and a really solid running back class, I don't think they can afford to not take Tracy if he's anywhere near the range of where he should go, and this is right about his wheelhouse right now. Another guy that I really love at 211, you have the Niners taking Trajan Jeffcoat, a defensive right. end from Arkansas. Um, I, I think this is another guy I really, really like. I mean, 6'4", about 270, which is right in their wheelhouse. Great athlete. Yeah. Uh, academic, uh, you know, SEC academic honor roll in 2020, 2021. He's a smart guy. Um, you know, there's production there. Uh, I, I really like Jeff Coat, especially at 211. Tell me why you why you love him so much. Uh, the frame, 
the frame matters, and he has shown spurts of elite pass rushing ability with his burst off the line. Uh, his the issues that he had at Missouri and Arkansas was that he um, he just wasn't there for them every down. At two eleven, no one's asking you to be there every down. They're just asking you to be able to go out there on a third down and make something happen. And on third down, this is somebody that you could slide inside, have him play a four eye technique. Get get to the pass, uh, get to the quarterback from the interior of the line. You can go a little bit of NASCAR package there, or you can keep him on the outside and he can hold the line. Okay, he's not a great run defender, but he's capable enough. You think about what the 49ers did last year and what they needed from their defensive ends. You know, they go out and get a Chase Young, they go out and get a Randy Gregory. I think Trajan Jeffcoat has a lot of Randy Gregory in him, and that might sound like it's a a, a big negative, uh, but he's being taken at two eleven. If he could be Randy Gregory for you from last year at pick 211 in his rookie year, that's a huge win. That's a huge win for the 49ers. And there is some upside because he's not going to be an every down player, but he has shown enough flashes that the downs that you do use him on, he might be really productive for you. I think it's a worthwhile dice roll with Trajan Jeffcoat because at this point in the draft, you get a lot of guys who are undersized and had really good production. And you have to question if that production is valid or not. You have a lot of guys who are really big and athletic, but have no flipping idea what they're doing. This is an all SEC player who it, it just never really kind of came together at, at the high level. He never turned into that elite player that people thought he would, at least on a consistent level, at either Missouri or Arkansas, I think that the upside is still very much there. He's a little bit older. Um, I think at 211, you could do a whole lot worse, and the Niners do need to improve on the defensive line, and they specifically need to get someone to replace Drake Jackson somewhere in their depth chart because that failed miserably. We're getting down to the end of your draft. There's only two more picks left. This one's interesting. Edifon Elifoscio. Um, who was, you know, he was, he's a kid who went to Bishop Gorman in Nevada and was a high recruit and, uh, he runs like the wind. He's six, one, two thirty. Once again, kind of an undersized linebacker, but just one of the fastest. Now the instincts, I'm not sure about the instincts, oh, really? but he's another smart kid. I mean, he's an academic honor roll guy. I mean, I've seen him kind of jump in the wrong ga- gaps and have some poor run fits. Okay. Um, I mean, when you're looking at a guy who's this fast, this athletic, you know, I think he should show up more on film. Maybe that's just me. Agreed but on that. Yeah. I, you know, that's why he's here at 215. If this guy <laughs> showed up at, on film at, with the measurables and the speed and the academics and everything he's got going on for himself, I mean, you're talking about a guy who would have been a second-round pick. Right. Um, but it's a little bit of a projection. But uh, tell me what you like about Ula Foscio from uh, UW, one of the fastest linebackers in the entire draft. It's interesting that you said you don't like his instincts because the thing that stood out to me was how decisive he was. So we are disagreeing on what he's being decisive about. And I think you're right. Uh, I just like that he just does it. He doesn't stand back there and think. And a lot of these linebackers, they're just so Im- they're just so patient. They're just go out there and kill somebody. It shouldn't be that hard if you're a weak side linebacker in the NFL. I understand there's a lot of stuff going on, but the reason we love watching Dre Greenlaw or loved watching Dre Greenlaw is because didn't always make the right decision. Didn't always make the play, but he went out there and got it. And this guy has the kind of burst and speed and decisiveness to go out there and get it. If nothing else, this guy is going to be a great special teams player for you. Now, I know the Niners don't need any more special teams players because apparently that's where all their money went, but can't hurt. Can't hurt to have another good one. And I think as a backup linebacker, I think he could play Mike. I think he'd be really interesting at Mike because he does have a good amount of range. I think at Will, he's just he's he's a killer. He's just a killer. The guy that I really love in this draft, by the way, is Cedric Gray out of uh, oh, North yeah. Carolina. I, I, I cannot remember. believe how low some teams have him. I don't know what I, I don't know what I'm missing with Cedric Gray. I don't get it. I don't get how he could be a possible day three pick. I think he's the best linebacker in this class. I really I do. do too. I do too. The, you know this. You know the one thing about Olafosio, he was voted team captain, one of only four on a vote of his teammates. I did Great see team. him in the Cal game. He had a fifty-yard pick six. Um, he's an impact guy. He is an academic on a roll guy. He's smart. He's athletic. I mean, there's a lot to like here. Um, I just, I, I think that, um, you know, I'd rather have gray and there's a couple other guys I'd rather have. I really you know like Tyron if, Hopper out of Mizzou. I think he's yeah, a really interesting he's, he's player. A really good well, player. I think, I think that the Niners in this late round option, if they need a linebacker, they're going to be in a really good place because there's a lot of guys lower on the board, even undrafted free agent guys 
that just fit what it is they want, which is, I think, more than anything else, range and decisiveness. And maybe they're not the best tacklers in the world, but you're going to feel them every time that they come and hit you. Um, and just to have somebody like that in there, you, you roll the dice because maybe their instincts when the game is being played at a higher level, a little bit less spread out than it is at the college game. Maybe it kicks in at an even higher level. I, I think it's a really tough position to evaluate at the college level with guys literally standing on the sidelines on both ends of the field and everybody passing all the time. Like that's not really linebacker. You're just playing safety. I two guys I just love on day three are Kalen Deloach from Florida State and Jamal mm-hmm. Hill from uh, mm-hmm. Oregon, who started as a corner and and yeah, he'll now small, is, you know two twenty five. Yeah. Um, but I mean you're you're talking about guys who could be unbelievable special teamer linebackers. Um, and then the pick two fifty one, you went quarterback. And there's a belief that you, you know, that they, you know, teams should go quarterback at, at least once in every draft. And you yeah. went with Tua's brother, Talia Tagavailoa, the quarterback from Maryland. And I watched him. He's, you know, built similarly. He's got some zip on the ball. What do you yeah. like about Tagavailoa, the little Tagavailoa? He's got a wicked deep ball. He he really throws a wonderful deep ball. And he was the Big Ten's all-time leading passer. And uh, I don't think they had a lot of offensive talent. Sorry to Mike Loxley, who I respect immensely and, and like a lot. But I don't think they had enough offensive talent at Maryland. And I think going through this draft process, I have been validated in that belief. I think he made a lot out of a little. And um, it's the seventh round. So go with the upside. Another name, I mean, Devin Leary, I don't think is going to be on the board. But he's somebody who I think uh, would really fit this offense out of Kentucky. Uh, Rick Scangarello uh, coached him there. That's probably more of a knock than a positive, but at least he'll know the terminology. And then uh, Austin Reed out of Western Kentucky is another guy to keep an eye on here at quarterback. I don't know if he's any good, but that dude throws the football as if there's a brick wall in front of him and he has to break through it with the football. And it's really fun to watch. And I would love to see that in training camp. So if that means 251 has to get cut at the end of training camp just so I can have some fun, so be it. But I think if the 49ers have learned anything, and throughout this entire process, whatever, it's just take a quarterback every year. If you got to cut them, cut them, but at least you get them in there and you figure out what you got. Like, there's a very real possibility that the second best quarterback on this team is someone that they could take very late in this draft because no one really knows right. what the hell's going on after Brock Purdy. And I don't, th- I don't think the Niners can reasonably feel comfortable with Dobbs or um, Brandon Allen taking serious snaps for this team. Roll the dice, get, get, get somebody in there. Hope it hits, and if it doesn't, what'd you lose? Right. No, I I I, I like that philosophy, and you know, it's the most important one, position in football. You should yeah, take I mean, one from one fifty down, the guys that I'm looking at right now are listed from one fifty down. Yeah, Joe Milton, Sam you Hartman. Milton. Well, Sam I mean, Hartman. Joe Milton is just I mean the, the greatest arm he's I've ever seen. Right? He's surprisingly accurate. Joe Milton, when I watched him, he's, I can see why he's Kyle got good him. numbers in the best conference in America, and he's got Gimmick the biggest conference. physical profile. There's True. work to be done, oh, but yeah. I'll take my chances on Joe Milton, Sam Hartman, Devin yep. Leary, uh, Gus Bradley's kid, Carter Bradley from South Alabama, your guy, Tagovailoa, Austin yep. Reed, I think is, is maybe the best of them. Um, and even I mean, further down the list, I mean, the Davius, uh, Davius Richard from North Carolina Central is an interesting prospect. So there's, you know, not watched him. look, they, how, do they, you feel, they, how do you feel about, um, about Jordan Travis? You know, it's funny. The coach loves Jordan Travis. We, we, you know, and he's the FSU guy. Um, you I know, know FSU this I, I think he's athletic. I think he's athletic and I think there's potential there. Yeah. I do. I do like Jordan Travis. If Jordan Travis. You know, is he might be overdrafted. Yeah, he will. He will be. But if he's sitting there in the Somebody, sixth or seventh round, don't think about it twice. Just take him. Well, look at this. The Niners took Brock Purdy and they found their franchise quarterback. It, you know, it might be worth taking another, you know, whoever you may want to give the guy, whoever the road scout that spotted Brock Purdy, you may want to give him another shot at it. You know, the That's bite right. of the apple. If he if he 100%. says, Hey, you know what? I like Devin Leary, then maybe go with Devin Leary. Uh yeah, just based on his Brock pick. I mean, if I'm Lynch, I might want to reward one of my scouts uh that way but we'll see we'll see i definitely like the idea of of a fourth quarterback that potentially could uh come in and because you never know i mean Allen could you know be just mediocre dobbs could be mediocre there could be an injury uh and if you draft the right guy you may catch lightning in a bottle it's it's and as you said taking him at 251 you probably get him to the practice squad anyway 
So it's like, what, what are we what are we talking about here? They thought Nate Sudfeld was the guy. They paid him two million dollars to go away because they found out pretty quickly he was not. Like, right? No one knows what they're doing. They pick, they took Trey Lance with three first round picks at number three overall. No one knows what they're doing at this position. So I want to be rolling the dice every single year at this position until somebody comes through and just hey, it worked out. I mean, that's all it is. It's just rolling the dice. And honestly, if you're picking number one, you're rolling the dice. If you're picking two fifty six, you're rolling the dice. It's all a dice roll. Some of them have a better, you know, a little bit more loaded than others. But like, I don't like any of the quarterbacks in this class, if I'm being fully honest. So just take someone at the bottom that you kind of dig and see if it happens. Or, you know, I'll say this, take a shot on somebody that went last year, you know, that you, yeah. that, that, you know, like I, I really liked Malik Cunningham uh, yes. as a, as a flyer. And I thought he had some decent moments, um, you know, from what I saw in the preseason. And I would still be intrigued by having somebody like that. So agreed. You know, just canvas the whole thing and take somebody. Um, all right, let's do let's let's do a quick exercise and then we'll get out of here. We've are, we're are, we're an hour and fifteen okay. minutes into this. We'll we'll try to do this in the next fifteen minutes and not take too much of your day. I want to watch a little Giants fall, but um, we're gonna go with the ESPN anal- analytics um, deal, and I'll share the screen right here on that, and we'll go through one together and just see what you think. Let's see. Yeah. Where is it? There it is. Okay, so now we're sharing the screen. There we, there are. we are. We're on the side. And Beautiful. it's amazing how much better this show just got. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> with our faces on the side. All right, we'll start yeah. the draft. We won't make trades. We'll just pick we'll just pick and with the Niners pick. I'm gonna say hit start draft. This is the this is the NFL draft 2024 ESPN analytics simulator. I've never used it before, which is kind of fun. It's kind of fun to use a simulator you'd never used before because let's be honest, once you've done a couple of these things and you know the simulator, you can kind of manipulate it so that you know where everybody is going. So, um, and then I got one main question for you at the back end and then we'll jump. All right, here we go. I'm going to hit start draft and away we go. We're going super fast. And here we are. We're at 31. No. And let me see. Now, is this, is this all wide receivers? Well, no, no. Well, it's, it, no, because Ennis Rakestraw is there and Kool-Aid McKinstry is there. Okay, I just okay. can't believe that Brian Thomas oh, is there. Oh, wait a second. Wait, wait, wait. I, what, what, wait, wait, continue draft, my... I think, is what you want. Okay, or make a pick on draft. the right. Okay, so now I'm looking. You're, do you just go Brian Thomas and just forget yeah. about it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, or your guy, Tavondre, is really high. Yeah. Peyton Wilson had unbelievable. He won the he won the Buckets Award, and he had great workout numbers, but he's got some injury He's concerns. Edron Cooper's a stud. Yeah. Uh, there's a bunch of guys you can go Sumat- Sumatia or, or, or I thought, Sumatia, I, mean, I think is how it is, but okay. you know, I could be wrong. Cedric well. Gray's right there, but he might fall. I wouldn't. Would uh, you go? I mean, Cedric Gray in my are mind. Are we trying to be are we trying to be realistic or are we just taking the obvious well, pick here? <laughs> well, here's the one thing. Where do the Niners need a starter? They may need a starter opposite Fred Warner. So yes. I mean but That's, I don't think and, there are any. I don't idea. think there. Are, I don't think there are any first round graded. I don't have any first round graded or second round graded linebackers in this class. I don't I mean, think there's they, a top fifty linebacker. Who do you like more between Brian Thomas and Xavier Leggett? I, I'm not going to lie to you, Larry. I haven't spent a lot of time with Brian Thomas because I didn't think he'd be here. So, right. but his ball skill. I mean, a lot of people. I just read an article this morning saying that he's boomer bust. But man, when I watch him I and I watch his film. This guy scored 17 touchdowns this year. Yeah, Lad McConkey, who's two picks under him right here, Doesn't scored two. Team. Scored Doesn't two. I like I like Xavier Leggett a lot. I don't like him enough to take him in the first round. I think Ennis Rakestraw is a stretch at 31, but he's I really cocky like him. and confident, but he's also 182 pounds and not big enough. durability now, concerns. That might be a slot thing. Uh, Kool Aid, Kool Aid's fine. Yeah, I think Xavier Worthy has Frank. incredible Had surgery. Yeah, incredible upside with Xavier Worthy. I don't think Peyton Wilson is a top 50 player. I think Keon Coleman is an incredible player, but all these guys are second round options. <clears throat> I think Sua Matia would be the one that if uh, in a real world gun to my head, I take Sua Matia because I don't miss out on this tackle class at the top. And I think he's the last guy in it. But I think you take Brian Thomas because Brian Thomas should be a top 10 pick in this class or maybe top 15. And he's sitting for you there at 31. And you're going to need a wide receiver at some point. This messes up my future plans, but you take him. 
All right. Well, well it's just an exercise. We'll do it. I love let's it. Go, this let's is take, fascinating. Yeah. I mean, this would be an exciting moment for the Niners if Brian Thomas is there. So we take Brian Thomas. So it now we actually draft the player and then they just burn through it. Now we dra- Now we're here sitting here at pick Bullard. 63 and you've got Bullard, the safety. I love But that. you know what? You do still have maybe the best linebackers going and Cooper and Gray. I'd have a hard time going. It's it's really tough. I I don't think Michael Penix is sitting there. Wow. Yeah, I don't think uh, uh, ESPN's grades are (laughs) all that realistic. But then again, I never know until the actual draft comes. Here's my thought with Bullard. Um, He can play in the slot. He can play strong and he can play free. I think he's an incredible athlete. Um, You know, he's a little stocky. I don't mind. I I think I think he is a, a dude amongst dudes. I don't love going safety here, but he's going to fit your scheme. And had we not taken a wide receiver, I would have very gladly taken Ricky Pearsall, but you can't go wide receiver, wide receiver. So it sucks I, that Gray is going to be off the board, but I would go safety here because there is a drop off. I think you I like Frazier. Frazier. I love Frazier. I think Frazier. Frazier I think Frazier is the kind of guy that allows you to cut Brendel, save some cap. I yeah. think Frazier is going to be a Pro Bowl gar, a Pro Bowl center for the next ten years. I don't uh, like how he moves in the off. I think he is a. I think he's a mean son bitch in the middle, and I think that matters. I don't love his movement skills. You could go oh. Rukaroro too. He's right there now. Rukaroro is a very good option here. Now it looks like he might still be on the board for us at ninety four, right? Um, with the way that this is structured, I don't think that's realistic in the least bit. Um, Marshawn Nealon, they looked at. Brandon Doralis, Doralis, they looked at. I'll say I'm this. Con- it, I'm concerned I, about I, Nealon's um, production in college. He's obviously there, an incredible chart buster. But uh, What about uh, Gray right here? It's too rich. It's too rich for a realism thing. But if we're going to just do it, we, we already took Brian Thomas. So let's just take let's just take the best players that we think are available. And I think of all these guys, the best player available is Cedric Gray. Yeah, let's do it. Let's go Cedric Gray. Now, we, at least we're. We're playing the board as it's coming to us. Yeah, uh, you know, I, it might I, happen I this way. Probably. All right, but now we're down. We're now we're down at ninety four. All right, at ninety four, you could go Brandon oh. Dorless, who is interesting. He, he yeah. kind of would reignite the the NASCAR package. Yeah, but then let's look at the other options. Uh, Rice's kid is there. I'm not D. Wayne nice Carter, guy. who they call him Mister Duke or something like that. He he's he's intriguing. Tyke yeah. Smith is a kind of a late riser. Yeah, I really like Muhammad Kamara as a ru- edge rusher. He's just a little bit short. That's right. A lot of those guys. Zach Zinter is kind of a nasty guard. Cam, Kinchins. I like Beatty. Or no, that's a different guy. Sorry, the Kansas State the- guard. He's probably off the board by now. Yeah, he's probably off the board. I mean, you can't take a running back here, but Benson is so good. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of speed there. I'm a you know I'm a big fan of uh, Blake Corum. Yeah, uh, Jalen. A lot of people love Jalen Wright. Elijah Jones is a good corner. Let me look. Mm-hmm. Um, this, you know, that, as I said, I don't know this mock. So your guy, Olafosio's here, Bordellini's there, wow. but we, we've are, you know, we haven't gone dra- Jeff coat all day. Ray, wow. Ray Davis is a yeah. good hell of a running back. Hell of a running back. Uh, Javon Foster from Missouri. You can go offensive tackle. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think we're, I think we're scrolling down a little bit too far here though. Just go limmer. Limmer. Tip Ryman nice. might be the best blocker. What do you Love think? Tip Ryman. Who, if we go to the top here, I mean, I'll give you this pick. I'll give you, you can make this one. So you gave me the one that no one wants. Um, because <laughs> this is kind of a no man's land. This, this is a tough one. This is this a- would be a pretty clear trade down. Can we scroll down just a smidge? Yeah, we got Marshawn Lloyd, Brandon Lloyd. Rice. You got the Yale tackle. I like he's the got, Yale tackle a lot. I'm yeah, not he's coming off a quad, but he, he may have the most talent of any of them. He's got huge wingspan. You like him? I take him. Yeah, I, I think I think he is. The class of the second tier. Yeah. I like him. Um, the smart. The, in, the length. The it's yeah. a projection. You're going to have to coach him up. He's not ready. But he also might be the replacement for Trent Williams. Yeah. Uh, a realistic re- replacement for Trent Williams. Jeremiah Trotter's there. Oh, my God. We've already taken Gray. But, I mean, you know, Jeremiah Trotter is misplaced in this thing. That's why I mean, this guy's. Um, that's a mistake by ESPN. We need to look at corner. Um uh, McLaughlin's a good receiving tight end. Yeah, well, I, I don't think they're going back to the Alabama tight end. Well, Bordellini has to be the spot, right? Bordellini, 
We, if you go in corner, let me see. Javon Foster, Bo Just Limmer is a center. Yeah. Ryman, Cromedy. Let me see who the top corner is. You're, D, picking, uh, you're picking three picks later. Well, so. Renardo Green's not bad. And you I also really like, like Renardo Green. I don't yeah, know he's understand dead. how he's a fourth round kind of guy either. He seems like a I day know. two pick to me through and through. I think Renardo Green might be my pick. They also, you know, Tony Pauline had a report the other day that the Niners are going to yeah. take Isaac Garendo in the third round. Is it possible that Garendo could be a f- the replacement for Juice? Because, I mean, oh. with, with Juice, this guy's 225, and the Niners don't use the fullback that much. But, man, if you want to replace Juice and give your team a little bit more of a dynamic, I mean, yeah. if you put a 4-3 fullback on the field with what they have, that might that might be a real defensive nightmare for some de- defensive coordinators. He, he's a really nice player. Um, I'm not sure he was the best running back in his own backfield this past year, uh, yeah. like Jawar Jordan. Um, a guy that, if we're just holding on for dear life, uh, Kamani Vidal out of Troy was yeah. insane. I really like him. Now, he's not a, a juice replacement is something that I had not considered. And um, clearly it's something they're considering because they damn near cut the guy. So that's an interesting thought, but I think we can come back to it. You know, um, McKinley Jackson's still on the, on the board here. That, that to me, if you really yeah. believe that you need that one technique, if you like mm-hmm. sweat, maybe uh, to be honest, I think sweat in reality might be here. Might be here. I mean, he, he, I think he's ended day two in reality, but, um, but with the DWI that might, what, what do you want? What, what would you like to do here? Um, let me wow, see. Linebackers. Let me see. Let me let me see if we can check out what we've done so far. Yeah. Well, how do how do we check out our own? I should picks? have been I should have been writing. Yeah, team picks right there. There we go. So we have Brian Thomas, Cedric Gray, and Kieran Amagaji. So, so we still need a defensive well. tackle. We need a we defensive still need tackle. An interior offensive lineman. What is it? We got a lot of. All right. Let's see. Let's go. Let's see what defensive tackle provides in this yeah. thing. Uh, Crumedy. Uh, Crumity Leonard I, Taylor, who was a hot name early in the year. Marcus Harris, yeah. I love from uh, Auburn. Uh, Jordan Jefferson brawled at the uh, Senior Bowl with uh, the UConn Which, guard. McKinley check. Jackson is right there. McKinley Jackson's fantastic. Uh, I think we can wait and get Zion Logue, though, out of Georgia. Okay. He might not even be in the in the system. <laughs> no, he's there. He's there. Oh, he's there. I love Zion Logue. I think he's a really fun, interesting player. 6'5", 314. Big broad jump it was a sporadic player at Georgia, but that's how it goes. Safety um, wise, is Carly's a safety or a linebacker? Uh, I think he's a safety. I think he's a strong safety. Uh, is James a Williams a safety or a linebacker? I mean, this guy's six five, two twenty. Yeah, he, he's he, a linebacker. <laughs> he is something else, man. I mean, he that is, is some. Malik, he is. He you know, is here's a guy else. right here. I could see. Oh, you know, great player. Malik, these two guys right here, Malik Mustafa and yep. Sione Vaki. Now, Vaki's right. going to join me next week on the on the, sh- oh, on that's the awesome. show. I talked to his agent yesterday. He's an Antioch kid who went to Antioch yeah. High School. And supposedly, according to his agent, okay, the Niners have met with him seven or eight times, and he said he's going to be a Niner. Now, he's a running back who converted to safety late. That's right. But But he's a hell of a player. And I don't know, you know, you might want to, they might, you might want to make a pick or two before you go that direction. But Malik Mustafa from Wake Forest is a thumper, man. He is a big time hitter. But we can wait on him too. Um, Yeah. Let's go, let's go something with guard. It's a offensive guard. Let's see. Yeah. Let's see what we got on the interior center guard. Um, because this, this uh, is kind of the wheelhouse for that right now. You can go Bordellini. You can go Bo Limmer. I like both those guys. Um, I like, obviously, I like Bordellini better. Uh, Mahogany Mahogany's an absolute destroyer, the yeah. Boston College guard. He is, so maybe, he is a destroyer. He's a little loose. Keegan is Michigan's captain. You could go uh-huh. with him late. Keaton Bills from Utah is a good player. Yes, he is. What do you, what, what do you, I mean, there, I, I'm going to say Bordellini, but I'm uh, very open to Bo Limmer if you want to go Bo Limmer. Let, let's go Bordellini. Let's go okay. Bordellini here. We'll this is also Bordellini. just a wheelhouse for Bordellini, right? Well, you know, now we're picking again real fast. That's right. Um, so now you it's almost like two for one here. You're getting, you know, I don't think is got, Tracy is Tracy on the board still or is he gone? He's uh <laughs> oh running back. Yeah, running. I, let's let's take a look at running back. Take a look. Oh, I'm sure he's on the board. 
I don't know. There he is, Tyrone Tracy. You want him? Uh, I would love him, but I'm also open to other things. I think well, okay. I think he's really fun. I have some really fun wide. Re- I think this is an awesome, unbelievable wide receiver class. Like Aeneas Smith is incredible. Oh, yeah, Williams man. is incredible. Let's go uh, wide receiver. Well, they already got Brian Wills. Brian. Uh, yeah, but this is more of a running back play. Now, is he going to be? Go lo- so here's the thing. Do you do you satisfy Christian by taking his brother? How no. much do you believe in Luke? I don't believe in Luke. I'll be honest. Yeah. I do I, like you know, Cornelius. I don't see Johnson. separation. I, I, you know, Kyle loves separation. I don't see separation. Well, and I think I like going to be more. Oh, I like Aeneas so a lot much more. Fun. So much. Aeneas, fun. I think, is a star. I, I, I think Aeneas, in some ways, Dieter might be the perfect guy for the new rules too. I'm with you. I'm so with you. I, I just cannot believe where some people have this guy because I, he's somebody that you know, I, I take notes throughout when I watch college football on Saturdays and he's someone I noted like eight or nine times. Oh, he's now a big time player. It's just every time he touches the ball, you're like, Oh my God, this is incredible. His rack is unbelievable. You know, I mean, you, you know, you, you, this, you're not, you're not bringing this guy down. I mean, he, he's a, they use him as running back. They use him as a return man. They use him as a receiver. I mean, he's a top in some 10 ways, wide receiver he's... for me in this class and a top 100 prospect overall. And somehow he's going to go in the fifth or the sixth round. I, I I don't know what I'm missing. I don't know what I'm missing. And no one's given me a good answer yet. Not well, that I don't know. Would, if I'm just the deeps, I don't know if the, the long speed. What what did he run? I don't know what he ran. I have him. right. Uh, hold on. You, yeah. What did he run? Did he run a good 40? I think it probably uh, Nia four, Smith five. ran a four five five. So, no, yeah, he did not run a good 40. That's not a great 40. It's not no. a great 40. Uh, that said, I bet his GPS scores are a lot better than that. He's a great football player. I mean, He's forget it. Forget the 40. Player. He's a great football player. Pretty sure Debo had a 4 5 5 40. <laughs> yeah. Should we go Aeneas here? Yeah, let's do, wanna... do it. Let's have some let's fun. Do let's do it. We'll roll the we dice. Love we love yeah. him. All right. So All now right. we got to uh, get, we gotta get a defensive now tackle. Let's go. Yeah, defensive tackle. Let's see what's out there. Or defensive end. There's Crumedy, who's got huge upside. There's Marcus Crum- Harris, who's a, who's smaller, but really, really stout. You got McKinley you, Jackson you I, still sitting there. I, I would ooh. go McKinley Jackson. He let's was go McKinley Jackson. Jackson. Yeah, let's go. Let's go McKinley Jackson. We're going. I have back no to problem. Him, I have no problem drafting any Florida State player, any Wash or any Michigan player uh, on the offensive line, or any Texas A&M player. Like, it just there are some schools that I'm just riding with. All right, let's see what we got now. Let's let's take a look at our draft. Where is it? Where do, Just to the right there. Team picks. There we go. Okay, so we this is a quite a draft, by the way. Brian Thomas Jr., Cedric Gray, Kieran Amagaji, Tanner Bordellini, Aeneas Smith, McKinley Jackson, and we have four picks left. Oh, this is our wheel. This is a hell of a draft. This, this is, really is a nice draft. This would be a dream. We could just not take some picks. It's so good. Um <laughs> All right, so okay. so what do we what, need? We best need a players available. End. Your, your Trajan Jeffcoat is there. Well, let's check defensive end. Yeah, we'll talk. Let's see what's here. Okay, there's Miles Cole, who's very athletic. Trajan Not Jeffcoat, Cole. Nelson Caesar. No, uh, this kid is kind of troubled. Yeah. Yabi Okianomo, yeah. but he, he's, he's nice played player. at Alabama. He's played at Michigan. He's played at five yeah. schools. But if you, but he, he's ridiculously athletic. There's also yeah. Brady McGregor. I mean, there's better guys. Also, this is not a very deep group here. Where I mean, there's a lot more guys. I like I like Miles Cole as a five tech. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's something they need. Um, Jeffco can do that too. Let's take a look at the D tackle list just to see if they've misgrouped anybody. Oh, that's fair. Uh, no, it doesn't look like it. Let's no, look at the outside pretty, linebackers. Austin Booker out of Kansas is uh, Jalen Harrell's old. a rusher, edge rusher from Michigan. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sold on him personally. Um, Austin Booker is that what he's in? Austin Booker from Kansas? No, he's gone. He's definitely gone. Okay. Yeah, he uh, and he. Cedric. I love him. He's almost. He he needs to put on some weight, but Austin Booker is a. He does. He has no idea what he's doing, but when he figures it out, it's game over. Um, what about running back? Should we go to your Tracy here? Or Garendo? Oh no, get Vidal. Let's talk about Vidal too, because Vidal is. He is a bowling ball. Yeah. And he rushed uh he rushed it something like four hundred times at Troy. And my favorite stat, I should have memorized exactly how many times he rushed the ball. My favorite stat is that he didn't fumble once. He was Which the first, good. the last, the everything for Troy. 
He is an incredible one cut and go guy. He is as wide as he is deep as he is tall. Uh, he he just made, I like the Sun Belt in general. I think it's a better league than people give it credit for. He made all those guys look like punks. And he he's 5'8", 220. It's which is aw- an awesome running back build. I'm yeah. Pull up exactly he's from Marietta, awesome. Georgia. He is. He, yeah, yeah. Here we go. Georgia's got some of the greatest high school athletes in the country. No question about that. That's where my yeah, his dad go. played football at Florida A and M. He's he also graduated seven hundred and eighty-one times and didn't fumble once. Yeah, I like that. I like that. He's it, you have to move on from Elijah Mitchell. You just have to. You, you can't trust him. You don't like anyone behind him. This is maybe a little early for Vidal in re, in reality, but this is this is your Vidal, and he's a great change of pace from Christian McCaffrey. He's not going to be a guy who's catching the ball out of the backfield doing anything. This is a guy you hand the ball to in November and December, and he gets you four yards every flipping time, and he might break a couple. I, I love him. I think he's great. I think he's the most underrated player in this draft. Let's go with him. Let's go with him. All right. Kamani Vidal. Yeah, Didn't like fumble that. once, Larry. Not once. Which, you know, that's one of the, that's part of the Elijah Mitchell value proposition for Kyle Shanahan. He loves the fact that he's never fumbled. He doesn't fumble. Why does Kyle Shanahan like to use Mitchell as a closer? Because he doesn't fumble. He falls forward. There's not a lot of negative yardage plays, and he does not fumble. A huge, huge factor. All right, yeah. now we are at pick number six round, pick two eleven. Yeah. Trajan Jeffcoat is sitting right there as the top player on the board. But do you, is there a position you want to look at, or do you want to review what we've done so far, or what do you, you need to look at? Corner. Okay, corner. Let's and this corner. is a tough spot to look at. Corner. We. Uh... I actually love the late round corners in the draft. Right. You can talk to me. Um, I mean, I like Josh Wallace. What do you think about Josh Wallace? Uh. I, you know, I, I, you know, I like the other, Michigan, you know, yeah, I, I don't like him as much. I like Beanie Bishop. Okay. Um, Marcellus dial from South Carolina, really good player. Oh, Dave on Ferguson from Bowling green, really good player. Um, hmm. dials got the best size Bishop. I think is the biggest playmaker, you know, once again, there's, there's, there's guys like from the historical uh, historic, uh, black colleges. There's a, yeah. there's some, you know, there's some really Mikey Victor, Who's a big, big corner? The Utah corner, who's monster size. That's right. Uh, six four. I mean, I think there's some better corners wow, that are probably even on the board here. Um, but is this there group, a DJ James available to us? No, he's way off. Sorry. Auburn. He, sorry. Yeah, I went to the Auburn Cal game. He had the game winning, game clinching interception he has, there. He has starting safety. All Let's over take him. a look at safety for a second yeah. here. Let's do it. Uh, where's where's my team picks? I, I don't Wait, love a lot of these late safeties. Now, I will say, draft. No, Faki no. should be there. Let's go safety and see who's on the board. Is Josh Mustafa Proctor still? should be there. See, I think you go Mustafa here. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, first absolutely. of all, 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 all these guys, are, you know, Carly's is a linebacker, but I love him. Mustafa, I, really like I think, is is one of my favorite safeties. This He's kid a true strong. Air, I know this is crazy, but this kid from Air Force is actually a really good safety. Trey Taylor. Yeah, uh, but you know it's just just because of the lack of success of Air Force. Dejon Anthony is a good player from Ole Miss, but I would go Mustafa here. I love the defensive end. He might be listed as a linebacker out of Air Force. His name is escaping me right now. Um, let's go safety with Mustafa. Yeah, let's right do that. There. He's he's and a really excellent player. Good special you may teams need to, guy. Impact you may need from to day start one. Him. Um, okay, <laughs> yeah. so now we're at pick two fifteen. Let me just double check our picks again. Um, okay, so we've got Brian Thomas, Cedric Gray. We've gone wide receiver, linebacker, offensive tackle, center, wide receiver, defensive tackle, one technique, running back, safety, and we got two picks left. And I think okay, so. I think we gotta go corner and we gotta go guard, right? Corner, guard, or best available. Let's see. Yeah. Let's, Let's see. see what um, got. what do we got? We just continue We're, the draft. We'll find out. There it is. Continue draft. And let's start with Let's go start with guard. Yeah. Let's see who's on the board. Um you got Keegan, who's Michigan's captain. Yeah, you, know, you know. Uh Cedric Van Prawn, uh Granger is also a pretty good player. You know, so there you got to me, Keegan would be the tough guy, but there's athletic limitations there. Um Julian Pearl's not bad. Let's see, yeah. what other spots you want to go? Corner? Corner. Corner, there's Beanie Bishop. 
There's Marcellus mm-hmm. Dial. There's Davon Ferguson. Those I'm are the guys that I like. None of these names group. are striking me. Okay, let's. I like go. Wallace, but yeah, I mean, what I, was I, the I, other you know, spot we talked about? Oh, how about tight end? We haven't looked at tight. Oh, end. hell yeah. Let's see what we got. Oh wow, you got real. You got, got D real. Ford's guy. Isaac Rex is a is a hell of a player. Now this guy yes. is a yes. little bit older. He's a little bit older, right? He's I on his Mormon mission. But this guy led the nation as a freshman with 12 touchdowns. His dad that's right. played. That's that wouldn't be a bad pick there. No, that's a, that's a great one. Uh, I have I have some notes on him that I want to pull up here real fast. Um, let's see. Defensive end. Let's go pass rusher. No, I mean, there's probably better guys, but that's not it. Um, what else? Defensive tackle. You've got Zion Logue right there. I do love Zion Logue, but they already got um, McKinley Jackson. Can you there. can you pull up linebacker so we could talk yeah. about Bo Richter? I don't even know if he's in there. Of the group here, J.T. Bertrand, John Trey Hunter from Georgia State's oh, a pretty good good athlete. Um, That's it. They don't have Bo Richter. They don't. Who, yeah, and who they don't have Kalen, they don't have Kalen Deloach. They don't have nope. uh, Jamal Hill. I mean, those guys are going to be here. At this point, I, that's probably who I'd Kalen Deloach. You got to go watch his film from Florida State. I mean, he's, he's 217 pounds, so he's you know even lighter than most yeah. um, linebackers. Let's go outside backer. Who's hey, outside? Can backer? we also can we also take a look at quarterback while we get the chance here? Yeah, let's take a look. Because if Devin Who's, Leary is there, oh, he's there now. You want hey, Devin now. Leary? Let's go, Devin, Devin Leary. Leary. We'll go, Devin Leary. I'm not the big. I mean, I'm not the biggest Devin Leary guy. I'm not. No, but he's got he's a hose. Big. It's got a he's, he no no one rips it like him. Okay. Okay. So Last no. pick, Jordan McGee is a great option, but I think we're covered at linebacker. This um, is best available, right? So now we're just going oh, down. Yeah. You go, do you go Frank Gore? I'm not. I'm not sold on him. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not either. There's a, there's something he's not quite. Um, I mean, it's it, Eni Bishop is a good option there. Yeah, um, dial Isaiah Williams, but we've already wow. gone wider. Caden Wallace as an offensive lineman. That's kind Caden of a Wallace. guy who fell through, fell through the cracks. They've met with him. I just did an interview the other day of Austin Jones. Um, there's Evan Anderson. There's Rex, the tight end. I think we might have to go tight end here. I don't think we have a choice, and I yeah. don't think that there's. I mean, I, let's go with let's go with Isaac Rex. Yeah, let's go with Isaac Rex. There's a tight end that I love in this draft from Furman named Mason Pline, who's a six eight basketball player. You almost have to go look at his basketball tape. His basketball highlights look like Aaron Jones. He's got ten and a half inch hands, and he was a mechanical engineering major. To me, wow. that guy is really an intriguing prospect on day three, but he might be an after the draft prospect. All right, there you go. Wow. So our picks are. Brian Thomas, the wide receiver from LSU. So now the Niners <laughs> just have a stacked wide receiver crew. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Group. Sorry, Debo. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and it makes it easy to trade Debo at the end of the or year. You want to get or rid of somebody. You? You're yeah. Good. You, you can, just got you a can, top 10 receiver at 31. Yeah. Cedric Gray, I think, is plug and play day one. I think he says, Devondre Campbell, sit the hell down. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Amagaji is a developmental tackle, but he could be your answer to, yeah. you know, if Trent. Uh, says C in a year. Bordellini, yeah. I think, is going to get day one. I guarantee you, Bordellini gives Brendel a, a run for his money at the starter spot. Yep. You get a return man and Ania Smith. Bye bye, well, Danny Gray and Ronnie Bell. You get a pl- you get a guy who could, you know, theoretically start yeah. um, opposite um, opposite uh, Hargrave, Hargrave yeah. inside. In a lot of ways, McKinley Jackson is the perfect player. To pot play opposite Hardgrave. There's a couple of guys who fit that mold, but he 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 ticks all the boxes for the Niners in that he has the size and the explosion. So uh, you're not going to have to pass get one past Kusarek with him because you get a bowling him. ball running back. Uh, you, you got a, a hard hitting safety. I mean, John Lynch reincarnate. Is that Mustafa's, right? You know, this Mustafa smokes people. I mean, I mean he, he, I, I'm not sure that uh, John Lynch isn't going to find Cole Bishop and bring him in just because he sees so much of himself in him. But uh, you could do a lot worse than finding Mustafa this late. He's an he's an impact player. And then a quarterback in Devin Leary and a and a tight end in Isaac Rex, who's six yeah. five and he's older, but he's ready to contribute. Yeah, I like it, man. I like this it. Is great. This is a great draft. It's a weird draft, but it's a great draft. Seriously. I, I, well, that's when you do these things, you know what? You just never know how it's going to shake out. Um, we also right, just talked about a, a ton of dudes, which is the, the real exercise here. Yeah. 
exactly. Uh, a couple star chats. Um, okay, this is my final question for you. Okay, be quick. Give me the player in this draft. It doesn't have mm. to make sense. Okay, it doesn't have to be a fit, but just the player in this draft that you are absolutely sold is not going to be good. Is not going to be great. Is going to be like all time. Do you have a Do you have a player that you have a conviction on? And my guy, I'll go first. I'll give you a chance to think. Luis Grolon says, grab Blake Corum in the third round. Okay. I love Blake Corum. Wow. I see I see Emmett Smith and Blake Corum. He's got the heart of a lion. He's he's a great kid. He's got great footwork. All the guy he scored more touchdowns than anybody in the entire FBS. Oh, yeah. Um, you know. Anybody, I mean, Michigan won the national championship largely because of this guy. He played huge in the national championship game. But, I mean, every time I watch this guy, he's just, he's an animal. Um, and he's hes from a tiny little town, Marshall, Virginia. Uh, his parents drove two hours to, to get him to, you know, play in the inner city of Baltimore his yeah. final year of high school. And he's just, he's all about ball. And to me... If you're a play action pass team, you've got to have running back options. I don't like some of the running backs they got. If Blake Corum is there, you know, um, deep in in round two, I'm I'm finding a way to get him. I I just think Blake Corum is a star. As I said, I see Emmett Smith. I think this is a great great player. Give me give me your guy. Who's your guy in this draft that you'd say? You know what? It may not make sense, but the guy's freaking great. Ricky Pearsall, wide receiver out of Florida. Wow, you love Pearsall. He, and he had a tremendously productive uh, career at Florida. He He's awesome. He's absolutely awesome. I love a lot of the receivers in this range. I love Javon Baker. Uh, I love I uh, Central Florida. I love, I love a lot of the second, third round rated guys. But if Ricky Pearsall goes to the right system, and my concern is that he'll go to the Rams. I just think he's going to be a dude amongst dudes. There, there's something about him. There's just something about him. Well, this run after the catch, he's got ball skills. He'll catch it in a crowd. He's got all, he's very he's, creative. He's, a game runner. he's an absolute game changer. And I think year one and in perpetuity, Ricky Pearsall is just a guy that gets it done again and again and again, and that we'll all know who he is. And uh, if I had to do it, but I, you know, if I had to really put a stake in the ground on someone, maybe a little bit later in the draft, uh, Aeneas, would be one of them, but uh, I really love Vidal. I really love him. I think he's, I think he's awesome. I think he's just totally awesome. I think he'll be awesome anywhere he goes. That's a good call. That's a good call. Um, we got one comment here that is so true. Jason says Larry gets off on gets off. Oh on. yeah, oh yeah. We're we're both. You know, this is why you can only see us above the shoulders. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on. Uh, you're right. I mean, uh, you know, sometimes I'll fight back and say what, what? No, you're right. No, um, clearly. I, I I'll tell you a guy that I really I really believe in. I think is going to be tremendous. Um, is Muhammad Kamara? Yeah, from from uh, Colorado State. I know a lot of people who are really high on him. And I'll tell you the other guy is Willie Drew from Virginia State, who's a corner, mm. small school corner. He was the only FCS player to get invited to the combine, That's and he's so. just the guy hits. He covers. Um, I think that guy could be a starting corner. And people said, "Oh, he's developmental." I don't, I don't know about that, man. I think I haven't he's just, watched him yet. I'll have to watch. Yeah, him. I mean, Virginia State. I don't think many people have, but Willie Drew. Deep Check down. out Willie Drew. Sounds good, man. Dieter, what do you got cooking the rest of your uh, rest? Oh, and uh, by the way, we have one super here from Danny Maderos. He says, "Larry, this should be the new Thursday night show." Um, I don't know. I'm always well, around, Larry. I'm well, always around. Know, D- the thing about Dieter, Dieter. Dieter is not just a football guy. Dieter can go baseball. Dieter can go hockey. Dieter can go hoops. Dieter's a year-round guy, so we'll, we'll, we may guy. have to dial it up because I agree. Dieter is phenomenal. Uh, I've been a big fan of, of yours, dude, since, you know, I don't want to embarrass you, since you first came to KMBR. I, I think some of the first things you we did That's on right. camera up in the third floor or the sec- second floor or whatever yeah. were just me and you kind of debating stuff. Uh, with Josh Lander filming us. and those I, w- I watched a couple of those the other day, and let me tell you, they hold up. 
Yeah. Up. <laughs> I didn't know. think that I would care so much about what was going on with Chip Kelly's teams this far <laughs> in the future, but uh, I, 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 I one of those one of those came across the, the the algorithm the other day in the most cursed possible way, and I'm like, you know what? Pretty good. Well, Dieter stuff. and I will uh, will get our agents together. We'll negotiate something out, and we'll we'll get him uh, get him on 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 a full time basis. Now, I also have noticed that you go, you know, you're on KMBR, you fill yeah. in, you're doing that thing, you're writing for the Merc, yeah. Um, but you're also doing the YouTube thing, right? Aren't yeah, you? we're 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 gonna give it a go. Um, try to do some stuff daily. Uh, bring back Warriors HQ, which was a wildly successful podcast that we all let go to the go to the wolves during the pandemic because we're idiots. And, um, you know, I, I, I talk with my man, Jake Hutchinson. We talk 49ers twice a week and uh, do these kind of war room mock drafts. And uh, anyone, who is, too. anyone who is anyone uh, who's encouraged by anything that I said, I highly recommend you check out the 49ers game day podcast, which at some point we're just going to have to rebrand for SEO purposes. But uh, <laughs> in the meantime, that's what it's called. And uh, we, we, if nothing else, have a good time. And of course, Dieter's a great follow on X at Dieter. Just real easy to remember at Dieter, D I E T E R. Spell it once, you got it forever. How did you get that handle? I killed a man. <laughs> I was going to say, I killed uh, the other five Dieters and, uh, as <laughs> yeah, the last standing. That's it. All right, brother. Hey, have a great Saturday. Thanks, Thanks to man. Pig and a Pickle, the title sponsor of The Krug Show. Thanks to Marin Autoglass. Thanks to Underdog Fantasy. Uh, thanks to our good friends at, at uh, Sharp Corner Sports Cards and Collectibles. Thanks to all of you in the chat. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, Dieter, have a great Saturday, and uh, maybe we'll talk this week. And I would yeah. love to have you on as a regular. I think it would be, be phenomenal. Great. It would be, you know, you and I chop it up as well as anybody. Um, what, what are your love Thursday nights it. looking like? Man, if I could tell you, I'd tell you. But uh, <laughs> as long as the Warriors are playing and KMBR is going, up, we'll, we'll, we will hash we'll something out, I you. promise you. Yeah. For Dieter, I'm Larry. Have a great Saturday, everybody. Peace. Yeah, never met a man I've been scared of. Careful, you won't get-